I will call this meeting to order. Good afternoon. Welcome to our 4 p.m. November 29th, 2022 special meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Calentari Johnson. Present. Holder. Present. Cumming. Here. Brown. Here. Myers. Here. Vice Mayor Watkins. Here. And Mayor Bruner. Present. Thank you. First up on our agenda is the consent agenda. These. Uh, I'll ask we're the not city. required to have oral communications in a special meeting. We will. We're not required to, and it's not agendized, so we don't have oral communication tonight. I'd be happy to connect with you outside of this meeting. I'm going to continue with the agenda. Our next regularly scheduled meeting, December 13th, we'll have oral communications. Thank you. Uh, first up is our consent agenda. These items are number one and two on our agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting and joining us virtually, now is the time to call in if you'd like to comment on items one or two on the agenda. Instructions will be on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device and raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls on your computer. If you're joining us here in person, you may line up here to the right of the dais, my left, and uh, you can sign in at the clipboard, So, but it's not required. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussions. Are any council members, are there any council members who wish to comment on or pull any items? Okay, council member Golder has a comment on number two. Golder, okay. Um, I'll make a, make a brief comment on one. Okay, Council Member Cummings has a comment on one. <clears throat> and let me just check, we have one Council Member joining us virtually, go back to that screen. Make sure, Council Member Kalantari Johnson, your hand's not raised. I don't want to forget about you there. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, so uh, let's go to our first comment. Council Member Golder on com comment on item number two. Which, thank you. Do you want to read what that is? So this is the resolution, um, or, or, excuse me, to a uh, the purchase of a type one fire engine. And I just want to say that I'm happy that we're purchasing this. I know that we've been having to borrow one from a neighboring agency. And I'm just wanting, I'm hoping that we have a replacement plan because um, it's a lot more money to be borrowing them than to have a replacement plan in place for the years to come. They don't, they don't last, um, you know, more than 10, 20 years. And so we, we, I hope there's a replacement plan for the next, there's more than one engine in the, in the, in the department, right? So that, that's all, so just a comment. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Cummings, you have a comment on item number one? Yeah, this, and I should just preface, I lost my voice because I'm getting over a cold. So if you can't hear me that well, I apologize. But this is a uh, city council and community support of the UC academic worker strike and fair UC now bargaining request. 
and as a former grad student, um, first I want to just thank all the grad students for their hard work on this. Santa Cruz and many of the communities that have UCs are very costly and expensive for graduate students to live in and pushing for fair contracts that allow people to have living wages while they're um, going to school and working at the UCs and trying to get their degrees, I think is something that we've supported in the past. And I'm uh, thankful for uh, the UC graduate students for bringing this to our attention and also for the support of um, council in previous years and for the council members who've helped put this on the agenda. Thank you. Okay, at this point, I will bring it out to public comment. And uh, let's see, I will just check to see if anybody virtually has their hand raised. Uh, the name I am watching you, go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. Uh, I support union rights to bargain for better pay and benefits for their workers. However, public education unions have a bad record of taking member dues and sending them off as political contributions. Hundreds of millions, some of which went to lobbying for closed schools and mandatory masks for children at no abnormal mortal risk from COVID. It punished students horribly, possibly permanently, while the teachers unions seem to be very unconcerned. I preface here by saying I have a very low opinion of UCIC and of public education unions. You should be saying nothing and let the parties negotiate. But no, the progressives aren't interested in that. They are interested in collectivism in all its forms. You, the city administrators, are supposed to represent the entire public. That includes the individual right not to use collective bargaining. Apparently, that also doesn't include students or taxpayers that would pay for these demands. This is more like one government entity in the peanut gallery urging a milking of that cash cow known as the public ever harder. The government is a no competition monopoly and is not a free market. Because of that, all government administrators need careful budget examination for fair spending and fair comparison is to the private sector, which seems the appropriate line to hold for me. I read a lot of these demands as outrageous and things the private sector would never agree to. Free transit passes, subsidies for the purchase of e-bikes, full child care, removal of foreign worker fees, no justification job security, removal of discipline authority to third parties. Hello, California has at-will employment in the private sector. I have no opinion on the salaries, but the private sector would consider many of these people interns or newbie college grads at the bottom of the pay scale for some of those kinds of jobs. Doesn't college tuition cost enough? Haven't students taken on enough crippling debt for them to attend? The public's willingness to pay is always a question when involving the government. The cost of living is irrelevant. <laughs> Is that three minutes? Thank you. I will now go to our next member of the public here in person. Hi, welcome. Hi there. My name is Sam Hughes. I'm a PhD candidate up in Santa Cruz in the psychology department. I'm here to speak on behalf of both myself and my 48,000 other colleagues that are on strike. We've been on strike for the past 16 days trying to argue in favor of fair bargaining practices at the bargaining table. So far, there have been six complaints that have been sent to the Public Employment Relations Board that have been all ruled as valid, that the university is engaged in unfair labor practices involving things like changing our compensation without our consent or trying to pressure us to stop striking illegally. These kinds of contexts are things that no public sector employee should ever be engaging in because it's actively violating the standards that we use for trying to do good collective bargaining. And so we ask that you use the pressure that you're able to exert as city council members in order to try and encourage the university to bargain fairly. The only way that we're gonna be able to live in an environment where scientists and artists and writers and thinkers can come and live here in Santa Cruz and other states, uh, other cities all across the state is if we have the kinds of wages that are necessary and the fair bargaining practices that we need to get them in order to be able to live here. I thank you for your consideration on this uh, particular item today. Thank you. Our next member of the public is virtual and the name is Aviva. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm Aviva Fields. I'm actually an alum of UC Santa Barbara. I was a graduate student there in the music department working as a teaching assistant for the five years that I was a student there. Um, and I have also been working with our union at um, 
the UCSF campus. So I've been working very closely with the postdocs and academic researchers there, as well as the graduate students. And I mean, my understanding last night is that the university and the teaching assist, uh, the sorry, excuse me, the postdocs and academic researchers did reach an agreement. Um, but the, uh, you know, it still remains for the university to really meet um, the graduate student researchers and academic employees where where they need to be, you know, particularly on compensation and a lot of these really important issues that allow us to do our work as the students who really do the bulk of the work for this institution and uh, people who are supported on research grants. Um, you know, this a, a lot of that the funding, you know, really comes from the work that you know the students here and the researchers are putting in the work themselves to to bring in that funding. Um, and so, yes, I, thank you so much for bringing this item to the agenda. It's great to see all of the the public support. Um, it's it's so important that people see this fight. Um, so, yes, I. I um, I hope this passes and thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your comment. It looks like that concludes our public comment. I don't see anybody else in person. There's no further hands raised virtually. I will bring it back to council for a motion on our consent agenda. I'm happy to move the consent agenda. I'll okay. second. All right, we have a motion by council member Golder seconded by council member cummings may we have a roll call vote council member calentari johnson aye golder aye cummings aye brown aye myers um i'm going to register a no vote not because i don't support um workers in any environment but i just not supportive and don't think this is really where the council should be putting its energy right now thank you so are you voting no just on one or? Okay. Uh, Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Bruner? Aye. The consent agenda passes unanimously aside from item one, six to one with, a, with Council Member Myers a no. Okay, thank you. We will now continue on uh, with our agenda and uh, this is our next item, agenda item number three, securing our water future resolution and policy guidance for water supply augmentation to improve water supply reliability for Santa Cruz water service customers. Members of the city's water commission have been invited to attend this meeting for the below item. However, it's not a joint water commission city council meeting. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you wish to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. We'll first have the order as a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from council. I'm hearing an echo. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff followed by questions from the council and then we will take public comment and return to council for deliberation and action. And um, I would like to uh, welcome and hand it over to our staff, uh, Rosemary Menard, our water director, welcome. Thank you, Mayor and City Council, really, um, Delight to be here. We've been working on this um, all year, and we did bring you a, a study session in August about this topic. So, um, hope to uh, bring this forward as a proposal for you to take action on the policy direction today. Um, I, I have a, uh, a somewhat wordy presentation here, and I apologize for how wordy it is. There's tons of words on these slides, but 
I want, I'm not going to read them to you, obviously, but I did want them to, while they're being displayed for folks who might be monitoring this, uh, you know, virtually or what have you, to be able to read them so people get the, the audio, some people get the visuals. So um, anyway, I, forgive me in advance. I don't have to, any charts and graphs. I, I completely mesmerized you with that the last go round in, in August. So no charts and graphs this time. Um, but I did want to uh, let you know that uh, I'm going to do the first three parts, and then Bob Rauscher, who's an economist, water economist, that has uh, worked with us on an economic impact analysis of the cost of curtailments, is going to give a presentation, and then I'm going to come back and do a wrap-up. So uh, that's going to be the order. And uh, Bob Rauscher is joined with some other folks, and there are water, other water people, as well as uh, water commissioners, as the mayor mentioned earlier. So with that, I'm going to launch in. Um, so our purpose really is to create sound, community-supported, adaptive management, uh, adaptive policy framework for what we want to need to do to improve our water supply reliability and resiliency. And the direction that we're hoping to get today and have you codify today relates to water supply reliability and the phased implementation of the supply projects to address our reliability uh, problems and issues. And its uh, goal is to provide durable policies of the direction that allows us to move forward with implementation. We've, we've been doing a lot of planning. Uh, there's a lot of information in the materials provided that sort of lays out the histories of all of that planning. And we really want to start moving forward now, continue to do planning, but it's time for us to start moving forward. Um, the key, what I really want to, um, talk about today are sort of the key takeaways from the technical and policy work that we've been completing, the policy development process, uh, the resolution and the policy itself, the elements of that, as I mentioned, the presentation on the economic analysis of the uh, cost of curtailments, and then a summary of what's changing uh, and what we're proposing to replace from the existing policy. Um, so the key takeaways are, uh, you know, Water supply planning inherently has a lot of uncertainty. I think if you were um, if you were sitting where DWR, Department of Water Resources in the state of California is sitting right now, you're feeling very uncertain about what's going to happen next year. You're telling folks around the state, prepare for another uh, very uh, low water use availability year. Uh, you're hoping, you're crossing your fingers that it's gonna snow and that there'll be more water than we've anticipated but it's inherently uncertain. Um, and even if you're on a groundwater source, it's inherently uncertain because ultimately the surface water and the precip, uh, precipitation, the weather is affecting what, is, what water is available. Um, climate modeling has, uh, has been completed. A lot of really robust climate modeling has been done in this process. It's pretty impressive piece of work, I think, that we've done using a, a really robust tool and it shows us that uh, there are projected increases in the instances of longer dry periods. And this is our Achilles heel for our water system because storage is our problem. The limitation of storage uh, is our problem. And you know, filling it up when it's wet is great, but if you have a six or 10 year dry period, there's just no chance to refill it. And that's a big problem for us. Um, curtailment of demand as a drought response strategy strategy isn't a very effective tool in Santa Cruz anymore. And we've talked a lot about that over the last couple of years, including what the work that we did on the water shortage contingency plan in 2020 and 2021. And I think that that is a, a hard reality for us to deal with. But I think that that is something that we've taken quite seriously and built into a lot of the analysis work we've been doing. There are technically feasible options. To, uh, to, to fix our problem. Uh, they've, we've done a side-by-side -side analysis of some project concepts. None of these options are low cost or even low impact with respect to energy intensity, for example. I think you've heard some things in, the, in some of the public comment you've received about the level of an energy intensity. And I don't deny that some of these uh, examples would have greater energy use than we're currently using. But the do nothing or use curtailments as a drought response tool isn't a low cost or a low impact option either. So 
that's where we are. Um, the process we've used involved, as I mentioned, completing the side-by-side -side analysis, and you have a tech memo in your packet that showed that for the project concepts we looked at, you know, what their costs were, what their what their description of the infrastructure requirements were, the uh, greenhouse gases, the complexities of how they were, you know, be, be developed, um, the, the pipes, pumps, et cetera, that are required. Um, and we have done that uh, as called for in the Water Supply Advisory Committee's recommendations. And I think that that's been a very good exercise for really sharing the state of these, these kinds of options. Project concepts we talked about uh, in our process are not the only versions of any of those projects that are uh, available, but they are they were available to us to do the analysis on, and we wanted to make sure that to get that information out for, so that people could see what those options are, and not to sort of hide the ball on any of them. Basically, um, we looked at how these uh, concepts, these project concepts, would reduce the supply deficits under uh, some of the climate change and no climate change scenarios, and we got a lot of data that we produced that. Was summarized some of that was summarized in the tech memo on hydrology and water system modeling that was part of your packet um, the policy that we've developed really is uh, I think comprehensive it's data driven it looks at the need for us to um, be transparent and to actively uh, work towards solutions but to do it in a way that people know what to expect and so that's the that's the plan behind what we've done here. And as mentioned, the goal is to get something uh, you know, in place in a way that's visible. That's why the uh, recommendation is to put it into your the council's policy manual that's visible, that allows for ready access. So if anybody has questions about how are we going to go about this, what are the criteria that's been laid out? Um, we worked very extensively with the Water Commission, and I want to thank them for what great partners they were through this whole year. Um, hundreds of, of person hours of work through the presentations, lots of technical information, great questions, great interaction on um, and feedback that helped us shape this policy, I think, to a place where I feel really good about where it is and wh how it can help us to address the issues um, we talked about stress testing of the water system, looking at a whole range of different supply uh, and, and future climate change scenarios. They were uh, troopers in working with us on the whole, the whole range of things that you see here. Um, so the policy elements are basically five, six, basically. There are the recitals, which are the tell the story. And people uh, ask me, are you really you're going to have like 12? recitals and it's like it's a long and convoluted story and having that background in place really helps to uh, create the context that says you know we've been down some of these paths before we we're at a place now where we've done a lot of work and we need to make some decisions there's a set of findings that I think uh, came from the analysis and the realizations that have occurred uh, in all this work that's occurred over the last several years I think those findings are uh, legitimate and they are um, extremely important to, as the, again, the foundation for the policy. Um, we do have a reliability goal this time. I'm going to talk uh, about more that in more detail in a couple of slides. I think that uh, the goal here is really to make it clear, make it adaptable, um, and purposefully design it to evolve as we understand more about climate uh, is is going to impact our supply and availability of resources. The resource portfolio is really kind of stating the obvious. We have only what's here. And these are the, uh, the options that are here are groundwater, surface water, recycled water in some form, and seawater. That's it. We don't have any other options. These are the ones we have to work with. I don't think that any of them are at a place where they can be taken off the table. There's not, this, this policy does not say which one to choose. It basically says there are strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and constraints associated with all of these. And we need to keep our options open because this is too important to uh, 
uh, artificially limit what we can do. Um, and we, the, it includes a fairly robust set of criteria, guiding principles, values that came from the Water Supply Advisory Committee work and were uh, amended to include uh, affordability and equitable access to water uh, provision that I think is uh, a key thing to have added. And um, it includes some implementation guidance so that there's clear expectation on everybody's part about what kinds of things can be coming next. And that's, that's the, the policy element. Um, I mentioned a little bit about the recitals. Um, I, I do want to say that uh, writing them and telling the story was an interesting I, you know, thing to do to uh, realize how long we've been at this. This is a very long-standing issue in our community. It has uh, a long history of um, failure, of coming up to the edge of um, making a decision and then backing <coughs> away. And this is way before my time. It's way before the desalinization uh, meltdown that occurred in the 12, 2012, 2013 time period. Uh, it's a long history of you know coming up to the edge and not being able to proceed. And you know, frankly, um, around the country, around the world, this isn't the exception that uh, it's it's pretty much the rule that this kind of stuff happens. But I think where we are with our with supply reliability and climate change makes that a chancy thing to concede. And so um, that's one of the things that I think gets told in the recitals. Um, we, uh, I think one of the other factors, and we talked a lot about this in the, in the process of, again, making the water shortage contingency plan updates in 2020 and 2021, we really have highly efficient water use. Our customers have embraced this in a way that uh, places us in a, a really great position in a lot of ways, but also has a downside associated with it's not very easy and it's certainly not inexpensive for anybody to further cut their water use. And I think that that's a place where we kind of um, are. It makes the uh, potential use of curtailment which has historically been a very, very important tool for us, uh, a, lot, a lot more difficult as a small producing strategy. Um, we have a lot of information that was some, some of which was summarized in the uh, tech memos about what's going on with precipitation temperature in history, recent history in particular, that is very aligned with some of what we're seeing and some of the climate scenarios we're, looked at, we're looking at. Um, weather variability is the key driver for us uh, in terms of the kinds of conditions that would be affecting what kinds of supply augmentation volumes we need to create. It's not so much about growth. Um, I know that that's not, that doesn't sort of line up in a lot of people's thinking, how could that not be? But when you see the fact that you know, historically, the longest drought we've had was 1987 to 91, and that was a four-year drought. It wasn't a particularly deep drought. Now we're seeing in some of the climate scenarios droughts that go 10 years, and those are the things that are going to drive how much water we need to decide to make, not whether or not we have modest incremental growth over the next 25 years, which has been playing very small. <clears throat> um, I think the reason that we're having a supply reliability goal is that we need to have a guide for the sizing of our supply implementation or augmentation solution. It's the way to say, if you plan for the worst case, then you have this much as how much you need to, to build. If you plan for something less than the work, worst case and using augment or curtailment as your strategy for when you have the worst case beyond that, then you can build something smaller, but you allow yourself, you know, you, you have a risk there that you have to take. And I think in the, um, in the documents that were provided, we explained why the worst case uh, scenario was chosen. Um, and we also talked a little bit about the fact that the difference between a sort of a 98th percentile, in other words, 2% chance that you would have something worse than that every single year, the, the curve is sort of basically going straight up at that point, um, which means that the difference between a 
a 98th percentile solution and a worst case solution can be three years of stage five um, impalement. And that's probably not really an acceptable thing in our community. <coughs> um, we, uh, we talked about uh, using this data-driven approach where we've sort of assessed a, um, a particular scenario that we've chosen, a worst case, a, a realization of a particular climate scenario. Um, it's, not, it's not the only situation that's similar to that. It just happens to be the worst of those, uh, of the ones we looked at anyway. It's purposefully designed to be uh, reviewed and adapted as we know more about climate uh, in, over the years, at least every five years, if not more, re more routinely. Um, and it does not include the routine use of curtailments uh, as a drought response tool for the reasons we talked about. Um, the initial climate scenario uh, was selected from this range of plausible um, and moderate um, options. It includes a two degrees of assumption of two degrees increase in uh, temperature, mean temperature, a 10% uh, a no change in precip mean and a 10% increase in weather variability, which we've already been reported into. Um, and I mentioned here that uh, we have about a 2.2 billion gallon shortfall in the last three years of uh, this five-year worst case sequence. Um, the reason that it's just the last three years is because all the storage was used up uh, in this kind of augmented system in the first two years, and then you're left with nothing, and then would have uh, the last three years when you the stage five um, uh, curtailments because the scale of those curtailments are huge, um, beyond 50% of total supply. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I'm not going to go into this in a lot more detail. The water supply portfolio is what's available here. Um, we do have technically feasible supply augmentation solutions for all of the, the um, the options, the, the source options we have, the volume that's available for them, the uh, the liability of those source options. Uh, in, in, for example, aquifer storage and recovery depends on having additional rain so that you can put water in the ground in the winter in order to get it back in the summer. And obviously, if it stops raining, that's a big problem. Um, we. Uh, the next item is this sort of uh, list of the guidelines, and as I mentioned, we have a, uh, a quite a robust set of um, guiding principles, primary evaluation criteria, additional considerations. I think this is, as I mentioned, came from the Water Supply Advisory Committee work. I think it was a, a really great piece of work that that group of folks did, recognizing that it wasn't, it was more about establishing a process for thinking about this and evaluating the options than it was about picking a particular option, which we weren't ready to do at that time. Um, and then uh, it includes, as I mentioned, the statement about affordability and equitable access that then uh, reflects the city's commitment to health and all policies. And it sets a near-term goal of producing <coughs> about 500 million gallons of additional supply by 2027 as a means of improving the resiliency and reducing the number of times that between now and uh, larger solutions, we have to implement some kind of smaller stage uh, curtailments just because we don't have a choice and we're not sure what's gonna happen next. And then finally, the guidance. Uh, I think for the, a real big goal of this one is to figure out how to translate this policy into action and make it clear what we're all gonna be doing next. Um, on, want to emphasize a commitment to exploring and pursuing partnerships with other regional water providers, seeking to increase supply and or address groundwater or sustainability issues. So looking, and we have very strong regional relationships already. So the goal here is to do more of that and make sure that uh, as we're looking at what our solutions <coughs> are, that to the uh, degree that we can cooperate, that we can uh, be, be capable to do that. So really, in Santa Cruz County, we're all in this together. OK, 
Okay, uh, here I want to turn this over. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Bob Rauscher, who, is, as I mentioned, is a economist with uh, 35 years of experience working on um, on water economics issues. Uh, he's been in a consulting firm uh, for years. I've known him for probably 25 years myself, and I know he's worked a long time with Santa Cruz, uh, including as uh, one of the consulting that was consultants who was working with the um, Water Supply Advisory Committee between 2014 and 2016. So uh, as we got looking into the realizing kind of where we were with some of the climate uh, change issues and recognizing that, you know, the often the go-to strategy if you sort of make your solutions less than the full worst case situation is you use curtailments. And so we wanted to really understand what was involved if um, that solution were pursued. And so we asked um, Dr. Rauscher and his team to uh, basically do this analysis for us. So I'm gonna let him share this with you. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Rosemary. And, and thank you um, city council members uh, for this opportunity to uh, meet with you uh, this evening. Uh, as Rosemary said, we done this study on the economic impact of water supply curtailments um, really as a way of looking at, you know, one of the important benefits of having water supply enhancements. We, there's a lot of information about what it costs to bring different potential new sources into the, the city's portfolio. Um, um, and and uh, this analysis provides uh, some metric of looking at you know why why it might be worth uh, doing that I'd also like to acknowledge my uh, my, my colleagues uh, Carolyn Wagner and Colleen Donovan they don't have speaking roles here but they uh, contributed significantly to the analysis and the report so um, you know, in looking at what the value of avoiding water shortages would be, uh, we've developed the report, and I think that's in your packet, so there's more information there. I'll, I'll quickly run through um, in my presentation what our objectives and approach um, were and, um, and focus a bit on the curtailment stages. I, I think it's important to understand um, how much water would need to be uh, how much water use would need to be reduced under the various stages and how that's distributed across different customer classes to really understand how much uh, basically water conservation would need to be uh, uh, imposed and effectively reached uh, to um, keep the system from running dry under different scenarios. Uh, I'll provide a quick overview of the different types of impacts on households, but most of what we looked at were the, uh, the business related impacts and, and really kind of focus on the key findings. And you know, there'll be an opportunity for, you know, questions and answers and discussion at the, um, the end of the whole session. Uh, a lot of what uh, the whole water supply uh, planning effort um, is about is about managing risk. And risk is defined as probability, the probability of adverse events uh, times the consequences that arise if those events occur. And um, Rosemary talked um, about the work that's been done uh, largely by the, uh, the um, researchers at the University of Massachusetts on uh, climate uh, scenarios and related shortage uh, outcomes. And, you know, basically the city and the utility have a limited ability uh, to control, you know, what, what the weather is and how much uh, water uh, nature provides. Um, in contrast, the, uh, the consequences or the cost of failure are provide uh, an opportunity to um, uh, have some control based on, on how you prepare to manage those risks. And those risks can have some, some high uh, negative impacts. Um, so we know that the cost of water curtailments can be large. Uh, there's a lot of foregone regional economic activity that might occur uh, business revenues are reduced, and as we'll discuss, there's a reduction in the economic output through the businesses and located within the service area in the city. 
uh, with the resulting uh, impacts on jobs, incomes, tax revenues, and so forth. Um, and while we're focusing mostly on this kind of business impact uh, related impacts, there are also losses to residential customers. Some of it is, is pocketbook issues from um, having to pay uh, drought impact fees and excess use penalties, and we'll touch on some of that later. But um, you know, there are also other other losses. You know, loss of enjoyment for those who um, you know cannot maintain their their yards and gardens as they would would uh, have hoped. Uh, lack of access to uh, irrigated turf areas for uh, picnicking or recreation, or what have you. And you know, when we uh, can reduce these kind of impacts by having a more secure water supply, you know, those reduced impacts really reflect one of the important benefits of having uh, an augmented supply. Um, and it all, all boils down to the old adage attributed to Ben Franklin about when the well is dry, we know the worth of water. Uh, so the methodology involves um, a kind of a standard economic approach of modeling regional economic impacts uh, using what we call an input-output model, and the, the model we use is implant. It's, it's a very widely used, uh, long-standing model initially developed by the federal government. And what it does is it track, tracks all the ripple effects through the local economy when uh, spending um, or, or other events uh, change in, in one part of the economy and, and how that works its way through. Um, and there are direct impacts. Uh, for example, if there's a water supply, um, curtailments and restaurants need to uh, reduce uh, their water use, they'll uh, inevitably need to scale back their operations, reducing what we call their economic in, uh, output or their revenues and their value added. That creates indirect impacts. Um, you know, the restaurant uh, owners and proprietors will reduce how much um, uh, labor they can afford to, to keep on staff, uh, reduce the amount of local foodstuffs they purchase, and other supplies that they um, um, pay for uh, from local vendors. And it will ultimately reduce the income that's earned by uh, both the restaurant employees and the owners. And then ultimately there's an induced impact because the employees and owners have uh, reduced their purchases because they're household incomes are reduced and the businesses that they would have otherwise supported uh, then uh, go through their own cycle of, of impacts. And um, so th this is what the impacts consist of uh, and we will add them all up and, and talk about the total impact, economic impact. Uh, when, we, when we talk about uh, curtailments, it's really important to understand where your water use currently is um, and how that's distributed across your, your many customers. So um, we're, we're looking at peak season demand because that's that's really where the where um, the, the problems arise in shortage scenarios, and that's you know 1.36 billion gallons um, uh, per per six month uh, peak season. And that number will, will come into play because every uh, curtailment stage reduces, is looking to reduce water use overall by 10% or a tenth of that, that amount. And, and so you'll see the 136 million gallons uh, used uh, in, in the analysis later on. Uh, but looking at who uses the water currently based on um, data from, I believe, 2016 to 2018, um, you can see the the blue, light blue, uh, the biggest biggest chunks of this pie are your residential customers. The, the medium blue here and the orange, uh, that's about 60% of, of water use is going to households. And then about another 20% is the light blue uh, slice of this pie, and that's for, for businesses. And the remaining um, portions are kind of split between the university and municipal uses and irrigation and so forth. Um, so when we go back to looking at curtailments, you know, this, this, these are where the cuts, it gives you a perspective on where the cuts need to come from. Uh, the curtailment policy um, was updated in 2021 um, and it's uh, contained in some documents that are, uh, you know, available um, through the, uh, through the water department and, um, but it's significant, 
significantly more restrictive than the, the version that was in place in 2016. For example, at stage three, the household limit has been reduced from what had been 10 CCF per month. Uh, CCF is a standard us unit of measurement for how much water is used. Um, and it was 10 CCF in 2016. Now it's four CCF would be the target in 2021. And um, uh, the community has had some experience with this new policy. In 2021, there was a uh, stage one curtailment implemented and uh, the water department found that 30% of the households exceeded their limit of five CF. So it provides a, a sense of how difficult it will be if you get to some of these higher stages uh, to, to accrue the, the amount of water. We'll give it a minute. Is he out of the country? Mania. Okay. He's. <laughs> Did he, um, I think we lost him. We'll. Yeah. Let's wait a second. Um, I'm going to have uh, maybe we have a couple questions. So, sure. okay. I, I Count, just, oh, sorry. Council, uh, Vice Mayor Watkins. Rosemary, I just was wondering if you could explain the difference between like what is irrigation and coast irrigation? That was within the slide. Oh, coast irrigation is um, agricultural irrigation uh, by North Coast customers who use um, typically raw water. Uh huh. So that's uh, um, okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Thank you. else maybe we should take questions Go for yeah it. we can he's there but not quite with us stop sharing his screen so. are there any other questions okay go ahead council member coming i had one question that um someone brought to my attention which was you know we have kind of what has historically been called the norm in terms of how much precipitation we're expected to get, but as we start seeing more and more drought years, at what point does the historic norm kind of change and we have a new norm that is kind of less precipitation? Is there a certain amount of years where we have to have a certain amount of like lack of rainfall to, for that to trigger? Or? I, I think that um, after the October 3rd Water Commission meeting, I might have sent through to you a, a, a link to a slide presentation by Sean Chartrand I, um, if you had a chance to look at it, it's a, it's a presentation he gave at that meeting that talked about hydrology, and it was mainly about the historic hydrology uh, trends we've already been seeing. And what he's been, what he shows in that presentation, and I, ha I have it open, and we can, I can bring up a couple of slides from it later. But um, what he shows in that presentation is a that we're already sort of in a new trend, right, from what we've been historically. We're not only uh, seeing warmer, um, warmer minimum temperatures, not so much warmer maximum temperatures, more warmer minimum temperatures, and a definite change in rainfall patterns from uh, you know something where we might get two or three inches, you know, November, December, January, to a few storms, uh, which you know clearly last year is a great example of that, right? A big storm at the end of October, a storm, a couple weeks of storm in December, got our reservoir back to 90% by kind of the end of February, and we didn't get a, almost a drop of rain in January, February. So this is a pattern that we've already sort of shifted, which is one of the reasons why this vulnerability we have to, um, you know, longer dry periods is really alarming to me in the role that I have and the responsibilities that I have for ensuring a you know adequate supply for our customers. Okay, you can come back now. Um, uh, I'm back. If you want me to continue, I'm sorry. Somehow yes, we got welcome this. Welcome back. Thank you, Thank Dr. Rauscher. <laughs> yes. Uh, 
enjoys a promote, uh, promote work in Zoom. Um, so I don't know how much of this came across before, but um, basically talking about curtailment policy, it's been updated since 2016 and is, is um, much more stringent than, than uh, had been in the previous version with you know, household use um, being limited um, in stage three, for example, to four CCF, whereas before it was 10 CCF. Um, and in, in 2021, uh, you know, thirty percent of households um, exceeded the the target lim uh, limit of five CCF when the stage one curtailment was imposed. So um, you know, these we're we're looking at some significant action that would need to be taken. Um, and uh, if you don't augment your supply, uh, then curtailments are really the only tool available to the water department and the community to to keep water flowing. Um, and the whole notion of, of the curtailments and the way they're designed are to prioritize public health and safety uh, above, above other considerations. And the water savings that are that would accrue, you know, probably wouldn't be enough to sustain the, the supply through a, a multi-year drought such as, you know, had been experienced or projected in the future. Um, and for households, the excess use penalties uh, can can get quite large. Uh, and there's some figures on that uh, in our report. But the whole intent is not to penalize people per se, or uh, but it's really to create the right incentives uh, to to make it so that um, um, households or, or or others uh, can't just say, "Well, I'll just pay and use the amount of water I want," uh, because they do do need to ensure that the water. Enough water is available to meet, you know, critical public health and safety needs. Um, so uh, each each curtailment stage uh, looks to reduce overall water use by 10% increments. So stage one is 10% uh, reduction, stage two 20%. And it, and I'll quickly go to the other stages where we focus our analysis. But just a quick glance here, you can you know the households. Uh, have kind of a proportionate reduction target that um, you know to the overall level, uh, businesses have have a lesser reduction. Uh, for example, businesses at stage two are looking to see their water use reduced ten percent, whereas community wide we're looking at twenty percent. So with the intent to kind of keep businesses operating as best as possible. Um, and a lot of the bigger reductions in turn come from um, uh, outdoor irrigation from golf courses uh, and landscape irrigation. Uh, when we get to stages three, four, and five, we're really getting into some very significant uh, reductions in how much water is available for, for households and businesses and so forth to use. Um, and you can see, for example, landscape irrigation, um, you know, that gets reduced to 75% of less water, and then by stage four, all, all landscape irrigation is eliminated. Um, one thing to notice for UCSC is that uh, they currently use about 21% of their water um, uh, allotment for um, uh, irrigation. So when we get to stages three and higher, now they're cutting into their indoor uses for dormitories, uh, uh, food uh, services and so forth, and um, you know it's it's quite likely that as we get to these higher stages, they may have to switch to remote learning in order to meet their water um, uh, use targets. So, so the message here is that there's there's a lot of water use reduction required in these higher stages, um, and and that will have impact um, these different uh, different sectors considerably. So for households, um, based on what we've seen uh, in 2021 and the fact that the, the target levels of use are quite low compared to um, what we've seen historically, that there may be a lot of excess use penalties imposed on households. Um, and, and while that reduces the disposable income of residents, you know, that will have an economic impact uh, on the community as households now have less money to, to spend on other things. Um, and, we, and we look at that separate from how we look at the business losses. Um, 
you know, it turns out when we look at it that it's a, a relatively small impact, um, less than 1% increase on what we get uh, from the other sectors. But uh, for some households, that, that uh, household budget impact could be significant. And so that's something to, to keep in mind. Uh, for businesses, we look at how water use restrictions can, you know, ultimately reduce their level of business and their economic output, which essentially is or net revenues. And that reduced output um, scenario then gets run through the implant model to look at how that reduces earnings for uh, labor and proprietors, uh, how it affects uh, employment levels, tax revenues, and so on. And uh, one of the key sectors uh, involved would be the tourism um, businesses, uh, accommodations, hotels, motels, uh, restaurants, and other food services are key focal points. And I'll, I'll, I'll show a little data from the pandemic from a, a study done by the state that uh, provides some insights for us. And there are numerous other sectors that we look at through, through the non-residential sector. Uh, and uh, this slide uh, provides uh, the list of the ones that we focused on. Um, now back to um, the, um, there was a study done um, by the state, uh, the state agency visit California using the same sort of modeling approach. And they, they provide data on um, tourism related spending uh, by county. And if you look at their, their um, report for 2022 and look at uh, the difference between uh, 2020 versus 2019 to reflect the impact of the pandemic, uh, which you know ran through three quarters of that 2019. Total spending in that sector went down nearly 50%, uh, but earnings and jobs and local tax revenues went down, uh, were reduced by about uh, you know, 23 to 28%. And then looking back at the, uh, the city, uh, the departments, uh, Water use data, we, we could see that hotels and restaurants collectively used about 28% less water. So this, this provides us a kind of a, a, a benchmark of how water use is, is related to uh, the economic activity levels within this important sector. And so this, this is the, the nature of the approach we used in modeling of, of how water curtailments would affect these different uh, businesses and, and affect their, their output. So for example, in stage four for the hotel and restaurant sectors, we're looking for, you know, 20 some percent reduction in water use. And we would expect that that would re reduce uh, their output by 20 to 30%. Um, and, and we used ranges throughout. That's why it's 20% at the low end, 30% at the high, upper end. Um, and we did that for the different stages for the different um, uh, business sectors. And uh, results, um, you know, assuming a 20% reduction in hotel and restaurant sector uh, business reduces uh, economic output in the service area by about $100 million a year, about a 1% reduction in overall citywide output. Uh, results in about a thousand job uh, losses and a reduction in city tax revenues of 2.8 million. Um, so in, in our report, we have several tables uh, and there's a lot of numbers here and I will uh, just touch on a few of them and we'll use some of them uh, later uh, in the presentation to um, pro provide some key points. But uh, you know, here we show the total economic impact uh, on the uh, business sector uh, 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 results for stages three, four, and five. Uh, for example, uh, if we're looking at stage four, the amount of economic output lost is uh, you know, 324 million uh, per year at stage four, or up to um, over $500 million uh, per year. Uh, and that's essentially a three to 5% reduction in the overall economic output of the community. Um, and associated with that would be a loss of jobs uh, of you know, 3,200 plus to over 5,000 or five to 8% of the uh, jobs in the community and uh, loss of tax revenues of eight to 12.7 million, uh, you know, 
which is a seven to 11% reduction. Uh, and that may be uh, a, a little high because the, the modeling includes some special district uh, tax revenues. So uh, capturing a little bit more than what's um, strictly uh, city tax based. So, so those are our, our big picture results. And one of the things we did is because there's uncertainty throughout this type of analysis was uh, conduct some sensitivity analyses. Um, we included some other uh, business sectors that we didn't include in the main runs uh, where that were less, uh, that, that might be a little less uh, water intensive. Um, and uh, that increased the economic impacts by about 14%. Uh, and we throughout because the emphasis on preserve, is on preserving public health and safety. We didn't include medical service sector impacts, um, though uh, that is a, a large water using sector and creates a lot of economic value um, um, because medical services are costly. Um, the household impacts that I mentioned earlier have a, a relatively small impact on on the economic output and so forth. Um, and then we also looked at including county level impacts. So uh, what happens in the city itself has uh, effects that trickle out to the, to the county as a whole, and that increased economic impacts by about 10%. So if you put them all together, um, you know, you could get cumulative impacts that were about 25% higher than we've reported here. Um, and this is really where the rubber meets the road is um, trying to look at these results and, and share some insights uh, on, on what this means for uh, how much value you would get for uh, enhancing your water supply. So we look at the changes or the incremental impacts of moving from stage to stage. So um, this focusing here on um, you know, what if you could avoid a stage four, a year at stage four and keep it at stage three. Uh, for that, you would need uh, 136 million gallons more than you, you would otherwise have. So what, what would it be worth to have that 136 million gallons available in that year. Um, and, and the change in the economic output is about 210 million to 260 million plus. Um, when you look at it on a, a, a dollar per million gallons provided, you know, that's 1.5 million to, to 1.9 million of economic output um, uh, value added by having this additional uh, water. We also present uh, dollars per acre foot because that's uh, another metric that's commonly used. So we'll put that in perspective here in a minute. So, in, um, you know, as I just ran through the benefits of um, avoiding a stage four level curtailment and being able to limit it to stage three, and both of them are, are pretty pretty severe curtailments, but. Um, uh, just being able to keep it at stage three rather than stage four saves you that 200 billion plus in economic output. Um, it's also uh, enabling you to avoid job losses of uh, you know, 2,100 to 2,500 plus jobs. And it also enables you to avoid uh, losing tax revenues in the six to seven million dollar range. Um, and so that's that's where you get the the 1.5 million to 1.9 million dollars of, of benefit per million gallons of added water, and um, you know if you also want to look at it in terms of job savings and tax revenues, you know that's shown here as well, the 15 to 20 jobs and the 44,000 plus uh, in added tax revenue uh, per million gallons. <clears throat> and to put this in context. Um, the water supply augmentation options that are being evaluated currently by the city, uh, they all cost less than $36,000 per million gallons produced. Uh, and that's the highest, uh, the high end estimate for the most expensive uh, option that's, that's uh, being looked at currently. So uh, to put that in, in some perspective, uh, those water costs are about 2% or 1 50th of the potential uh, economic impact benefit. Um, so essentially, if you can 
in 50 year period avoid one level four curtailment and reduce it to a level three curtailment, um, uh, it's, it's a break even proposition. Um, we went through this making several conservative assumptions. Uh, we didn't consider, for example, that businesses could relocate, uh, you know, cities uh, based businesses that uh, are suffering because there's not enough water for them to conduct their normal business might close um, permanently and, and or relocate elsewhere, which have uh, more longer term negative impacts than one year. Uh, a new or expanded business might be motivated to um, to locate elsewhere rather than in the city. <clears throat> and the uh, household disposable impacts uh, are not included here. Um, um, so they're relatively small. And finally, um, you know, our work is is consistent with what we've seen in some other studies uh, taking this, the same approach. For example, uh, a uh, piece of work done by Dave Mitchell in 2008 uh, for East Bay Mud uh, in the Bay Area uh, found that a 15% curtailment uh, versus a 25% uh, curtailment you know, resulted in, in you know, essentially a 19 uh, billion plus uh, loss in economic output. Um, and that if they basically added 8 billion gallons to their supply, they would uh, um, save about 2.4 million of output uh, per million gallons added. So that 2.4 million uh, compares to the 1.5 to uh, 1.9 million uh, that we, we derived. So uh, with that, I'm done. I'll turn the screen back over to Rosemary. Thank you. talk a little bit about the uh, economic, uh, um, or what kinds of things are changing and uh, how, how, what, how, what policy is being replaced. I think you've seen some things in some of the uh, public comments about um, old uh, policies, so to speak, and I wanted to take you back to where that policy came from. 2003 integrated water plan uh, work that was basically said, um, they used a well-established sort of least cost planning approach that treated uh, supply uh, and water conservation demand, long-term demand management act actions on the on you know equal plane. Uh, ultimately, re recommended a three-part strategy that involved um, uh, 300 million gallons in additional demand, long-term demand reduction through conservation and efficiency improvement, routine curtailments. Uh, of up to 15%, which was stage two of the 2009 plan, was, uh, but did not in, uh, involve rationing. Uh, those curtailments were mostly voluntary reductions in one water and one water cycle per hundred day labor history, and a two and a half million gallon capacity, uh, million gallons per day capacity desalinization plant that was to be, be developed uh, as a regional project with SoCal Creek Water District. And the, the plan there was they were going to use it to augment their, to uh, get off their groundwater pumping and create the additional supply in their aquifer that would take the seawater out. And we were going to use it in the drought period. They would stop using it then, go back on their groundwater, and we would use it in the drought period. Um, but that obviously changed. Um, but by the time we got to the, to, uh, you know, the work we've done most recently, what we're seeing is um, that we basically have a billion gallons in demand reduction. The level of demand in uh, 2002, 2004 was 3.9 billion gallons a year. It's 2.5 billion gallons a year now. So a bill, roughly a billion gallons of demand reduction, a long-term demand reduction or stable demand reduction has occurred. Highly this highly efficient water use makes routine use of curtailments uh, at every stage of the plan expensive and impactful. And um, no supply project has been built, so because we haven't gotten there yet, 
So our, our situation, we're actually more vulnerable now to uh, droughts than, than we were earlier because we no longer have this discretionary or flood water management capacity. Um, and in the water supply advisory committee work that was done 2014 to 2015, there was a clear uh, problem statement including the need to plan for the worst case drought with a deficit of about 1.2 billion gallons over the 76, 77 historical drought uh, and with some climate change that was added into that. Um, that's a little bit, the droughts we're seeing now are a little bit uh, worse than that, but they're not, you know, that orders of magnitude worse because now we're looking at a five-year drought and we're looking at, um, you know, a, a situation in which um, that's basically not as, uh, you know, we're not getting a replenishment uh, after just a couple of years like we were uh, earlier. Um, and the goal was to, uh, you know, achieve the uh, additional, some additional demand reduction, long-term demand reduction, but that's basically been achieved in this cumulative and going down from about five million gallons to about 1.2 billion gallons. Um, the FOSAC process also laid out this process for evaluating and selecting one or more supply augmentation projects to meet the worst case drought conditions. <laughs> Uh, considered the impact of climate change, and then provided the direction on guiding principles and the, you know, the how to you know, make the decision in a way that reflected the community's values and priorities. <laughs> and then it created an adaptive man management strategy to allow us to incorporate new information uh, as it was developed over the implementation during the three decades. Um, so basically where we are is uh, to kind of come down to the end established clear goals, uh, adaptable and attitude-driven uh, reliability goals. We want to maintain and build on the WASAC work, especially related to basic problem uh, definition, guiding principles, uh, and criteria. Uh, and uh, we want to replace the now no longer practical 2003 IWP policy related to community drug concealment. And we want to emphasize moving forward um, as a, to clearly meet the needs uh, that we have as climate change is really you know, changing and, and kind of exacerbating our issues with um, vulnerability from dry conditions. Just to sort of finalize with a couple of slides about what this policy is and what it is not. Uh, it is responsive to plausible and moderate assumptions about climate change. Clear about what our water supply reliability <coughs> is and why use of curtailment does exist and has historically been limited. It is transparent about the process and means uh, for incrementally uh, implementing supply augmentation projects necessary to meet our goal. And what is not, it's not based on standards or assumptions that grow in an untimely manner. It's not recommending production of supply augmentation projects to be due at this and it does not eliminate further consideration of the storage and recovery as a potential component of our supply portfolio. And it doesn't ignore the relationship between the increased energy use for some of the supply uh, uh, options we're looking at. Um, but the question that it does sort of take on is if we have to make those kinds of decisions in order to uh, meet our reliability goal then, you know, that's something that we have to do because the downside risk is not sustainable, it's not free or, or cost neutral. And with that, I believe your question. Thank you so much for that presentation. And thank you to Dr. Bob Rauscher, if he is still joining us. I appreciate the economic uh, analysis and the look into those different stages that was certainly eye-opening and um, I want to bring it out to our council members for any questions before we head out to public comment on this item do any council members have any further clarifying questions at this time 
I have some bigger questions, and I think I'll just save those until after the public gets an opportunity. Okay, great. All right, I will at this time then bring it out to our public comment. And if you are here to comment on uh, agenda item number three, securing our water future resolution and policy guide for water supply augmentation, uh, and joining us virtually, you can raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls on your computer. When it's your turn to speak, you will hear an announcement that you've been unmuted and the timer will be set to two minutes. Members of the public who are joining us here in chambers, please line up to the right of the dais you will have two minutes to speak, and we ask that you sign in to ensure correct spelling of your name. However, it is not required. And water commissioners who wish to comment, if you could just please identify yourself before you speak, you will have three minutes to speak. And you can just identify yourself by name and that you are a water commissioner, and that way our city clerk can adjust the clock accordingly. Okay, I'm going to go out to see if there are any hands raised. It looks like we currently have three hands raised. We've got three people joining us in person, so I'll alternate. Um, and so our first person is Jim Meckis with hand raise. If you could press star six to unmute yourself. Welcome. Can you hear me? Yes. Mayor Brunner and Council, my name is Jim Meckes. I'm a previous water commissioner. And before that, I participated in all the WASAC meetings. I strongly ask your support in favor of this water resolution. The one major responsibility our city charter asks of water commissioners is development of Santa Cruz's long range water plan. That's working with the water department. And this is it. Developed over more than six years that began with WASAC and now complete. It's been vetted by outside experts. It's ready for your approval. The supporting evaluation criteria analysis on page 3.43 of your packet clearly shows that ASR, while necessary to provide storage, cannot close a realistic five-year drop gap all by itself because it only gets us 60% of the way there. While water solutions are indeed costly, the lack of water solutions will cost even more. On page 3.56, Bob Rauscher's Economic Impacts of Water Supply Curtailments, it documents that even the most expensive solution path will be far less costly for Santa Cruz than the economic damage caused by ongoing water rationing. Over the last 50 years, several previous councils have missed key lower cost opportunities to act that are no longer available. This resolution provides a clearly codified policy, policy and evaluation process, providing necessary guidance going forward so that effective water portfolio decisions can be made. A lot of water knowledge has been developed by both council and the water department over the last six years. It is vital to preserve that institutional knowledge that's been gained, and this resolution does that with a scientifically valid methodology. This is the day to take a first step to a water secure future for our children and our grandchildren. I ask you to please vote yes to approve. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. I will now invite our member of the public here in person. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, Mayor Bruner and members of the council, my name is Walt Wadlow. I reside on Sumner Street here in the city. I am here today asking you to first support the resolution establishing a policy on securing our water future and second to direct staff to add the policy direction in the resolution to the city council's policy manual. I have over 40 years of experience in the public water supply field. I've had the opportunity to serve as chief operating officer for Valley Water, directing the water utility, serving over 2 million people in Santa Clara County and as general manager for the Alameda County Water District, 
as Director of Utilities for the Nonprofit Water Now Alliance, and most relevantly, I concluded 10 years of service on the City of Santa Cruz Water Commission. I joined the Water Commission just as the former Water Department Director was unveiling the initial desalination project. As Rosemary alluded to, it did not receive rousing support from the public. Several aspects of the specific proposed project, and especially the lack of public involvement in its development, led to significant public opposition. In contrast to that effort, the current director and staff have conducted a multi-year transparent process with continuing extensive public involvement, including the Water Supply Advisory Committee, which has continued to endorse staff's work to bring you not a single project, but a policy on securing Santa Cruz's water future. Importantly, the policy supports ongoing adaptive management, critical to selecting and implementing projects incrementally in today's demanding environment and the changing environment that we see driven by climate change, among other factors. I note that a number of the public comments the Council received urge a single project approach to the exclusion of others, an approach that is unlikely to meet the city's needs with respect to a sustainable and affordable water supply with equitable access. For decades, Santa Cruz has needed to establish a more consistently reliable water supply that will meet the needs of its residents, its businesses, and the wildlife that also depend on our Santa Cruz mountain water resources. It's time to secure our water policy futures now, and I urge you to support the staff recommendations. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I will now go to our next uh, member of the public joining us virtually, NVC Santa Cruz. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, this is Rick Longinati. Um, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Great, thank you, Mayor. Um, well, first of all, I, I really want to appreciate uh, Rosemary and the Water Department for developing the WASAC recommendations over the last several years. Um, I think, and also, I think the Water Department has done an outstanding job of repairing our existing infrastructure, something that was allowed to, to deteriorate, and it's been expensive, but really needed, and, and, and it's something that I deeply appreciate. Um, the only concern I've had for the water department is, has come just just now, which is uh, the notion of setting a goal that uh, for water reliability that would say we want to meet all our demands in the future in a five-year drought. We don't want to ev ever ask somebody to take a shorter shower or not water their lawn or not water a golf course. Uh, that seems to me problematic on two levels. One is that... Uh, with that kind of goal, um, it's going to be very expensive, you know, and, and those costs fall onto to the lower water tier users as well as the higher water tier users. So we're asking people who already don't use very much and, and who have been conserving to pay for, for a goal that will never have to ever cut back on water use. The second problem with the is, is it doesn't fit with our ethic. Look, one of the, the great features of Santa Cruz is that we conserve. We, we're, we're an example. We're a model to the state. Now, what does it say that we're, you know, now we're changing, now we're going to have a goal that ne we'll never have to conserve again. Um, that erodes our ethic. We can, we should consider our ethic as substantial as a dam or other piece of water infrastructure and nurture that and not let it deteriorate. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public here in person, welcome. Good evening, thank you. And it's really nice to have you back here in person and to have us back as well. Uh, my name is Becky Steinbrunner. I'm a resident of the Aptos Hills, but I care a lot about water because it affects us all. And that's why I have attended most of the uh, Santa Cruz City Water Commission meetings, as well as the county and other water issues. I want to really support what Mr. Longinati has just said, as well as recognize the hard work in the past of Mr. Scott McGilvray and others of his mindset in the water for Santa Cruz, urging conservation as the WASAC did, and also really uh, prioritizing and asking you to prioritize the idea of water, regional water sharing. The issue in our county is that, uh, for this area, is that um, the storage of water when we have it is a problem. 
So I want to ask you to consider that as you, as you look at this resolution and as you are asked in the future to approve projects, I also think you should not put all your eggs in one basket. It should be a palette of projects. But I would like to ask you to select those and prioritize those that are less energy dependent and less technology dependent. It is notable that the indirect potable reuse, which is very energy dependent, technology dependent, and could pose some long-term health risks because there are no studies done for uh, chronic and low-grade exposure of hormones, pharmaceuticals, and things that cannot be removed from the recycled water, that you, you instead put your um, thoughts toward collecting rainwater when it comes and having it available. That is what our climate change models are showing us. And I, I ask you to look at partnering with Soquel Creek to develop the Glenwood Reservoir and to build rainy collectors to collect water when we have it. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Our next uh, member of the public virtually is Justin Burks. You can press star six to unmute. Good evening, can you hear me? Hello, welcome. Oh. Hello, Mayor Bruner and members of the City Council. Uh, my name is Justin Burks, Vice Chair of the Water Commission. I'm honored to be on this commission and be part of, a, of our community here. Uh, Santa Cruz is looked up to throughout the state as a model of conservation. We have a culture of conservation that's woven in the fabric of our community that will continue as we invest in diversifying our water supply. We've seen both from our own experiences and Dr. Rosher's presentation that significant expensive rationing during drought is no longer a strategy we can rely on. We need to diversify where we get our water. And this is coming from someone who's privileged to be a, a leading expert in water conservation professionally with over 10 years of experience in the field. As Director Menard mentioned, this data-driven policy is a product of years of community engagement and technical work. And the project concepts in this policy provide a roadmap for investing in our, in, in our infrastructure to ensure a reliable, safe water supply that will be more cost effective than doing nothing or relying on the strategies of the past. The diverse project concepts provide us options. So this policy has the potential to be a model of bringing parties together and developing the water supply this community desperately needs to develop as soon as possible. I encourage you to adopt this resolution and to support staff's ongoing work to secure a reliable water supply as we move into the future. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I would like to welcome the next member of the public here in person. And if you can adjust the microphone to your mouth level. Mayor Bruner, Vice Mayor Watkins, members of council, I'm Doug Engfer, member of the Water Commission. Today I address my remarks both to council and to my fellow citizens. Seven years ago, almost to the day, I sat over here with Rosemary, had the honor to present the WASAC findings to our then seated city council as we embarked on our supply augmentation journey. Today I'm proud to comment on our diligent, methodical, consistent pursuit of that work and to support the codification of that work as council policy. Throughout our work, foundational principles have continuously informed our processes, policies, and practices, including social and generational equities, as evidenced in our rate structure and financing strategy, transparency, as reflected in our monthly meetings and quarterly WASAS updates, accountability, as demonstrated in our commitment to data-based analyses, and of course, stewardship of financial and environmental resources. Our adherence to advanced Adaptive management strategies and data-based analyses have been critical to our progress and success to date. When the data change, we reevaluate our assumptions and conclusions. Notable changes from WASAC days include the fact that consumption is down roughly 20% from the uh, levels we were seeing at that time. Climate impacts are likely more consequential than earlier thought, affecting the scale and scope of surface water availability. And California's Sustainable Groundwater Management Act defines new ground rules and players that will influence, if not circumscribe, collaborative efforts such as water transfers and, uh, and ASR. We have a successful track record to date in Mid-County. It remains to be seen how well we'll be able to work in Santa Margarita. 
The resolutions before you update our journey and set our forward direction. They codify the rules of the road and commit to our destination. It will be up to future leaders and citizens to finalize and navigate the detailed roadmap, defining and pursuing a specific project portfolio that solves the problem now and for generations to come. I've long maintained that our independence from outside supplies is an asset, not a liability. We can have control over our water destiny. Our work demonstrates that we have the means to provide long-term sustainable water supply reliability. It's now up to us to assert our will to entrust our ultimate success to the data, the process, and future leaders and citizens. I urge council to adopt and the town to embrace these resolutions as city policy relating to water supply augmentation and reliability. Thank you as always for your time, support, and service to our town. Thank you for your comment. Our next uh, member of the public is Virtual Sierra. Go ahead and press star six to unmute. All right, can you hear me? Hi, welcome. Hello. Good evening, council members and Mayor Bruner. My name is Sierra Ryan, and it has been my pleasure to chair the Water Commission during the development of the Securing Our Water Future Framework. Firstly, I would like to commend staff on this effort. It has been organized stepwise process that builds upon the last several decades of work and is true to the values set forth by the Water Supply Advisory Committee and by the community. Secondly, I want to express my support for this item, which provides the guidance the staff and the commission need to advance very necessary projects, and I hope that you vote to approve. My primary job is as the Water Resources Program Manager at the County of Santa Cruz, I would like to use some of my time to provide some context about the timeliness of this work and the urgency to move it forward. Water resource management in Santa Cruz County is changing at a pace and scale not seen in at least 60 years. The driver for this is climate change. The systems that we rely on for water supply and that support the environment that we cherish rely on a climate that does not exist anymore. Block Loman was designed to fail every year. Our groundwater basins were expected to recharge at certain rates and our stream flows were sufficient to support important fish species. The last decade has shown us that those expectations no longer reconcile with reality and we need supply augmentation. In response to the new paradigm where the historically normal is no longer the norm, every water agency in the county is working at an unprecedented scale to develop, design, and implement projects and management actions to bolster water supply reliability. This is happening not only at the individual water agency level, but more often regionally through partnerships. Some of these partnerships, for example, the Santa Margarita and Santa Cruz Mid-County Groundwater Agencies require regional cooperation to meet quantified metrics for sustainability. The City Water Department is the largest water supplier in the county. As such, it's also an important partner in regional supply planning. The policy being proposed tonight provides the Water Department and the Water Commission the guidance we need to move forward with developing water supplies for the for our customers, but it also supplies our partners in the groundwater agencies and beyond with a clear path forward that can be used for regional supply planning purposes. The data that the Water Commission has been presented over the past few months on the likely future rain patterns, the system's vulnerability to those patterns, and the financial and social cost of inaction or even insufficient action has demonstrated that there are no easy options, but there are options that will protect the quality of life of our community. To be clear, we can and will continue to conserve water, but we cannot conserve our way out of this problem, and relying solely on surface water to be there when we need it is dangerous. Adaptive planning based on sound science is the only way forward. Again, I urge you to adopt this policy, and I thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. Uh, we have another hand raised. The name is I Am Watching You. Yes, thanks. Uh, you know, I didn't really want to speak to this. Hey, how come I have two minutes and other people had three minutes? How does that work? Anyway, um, you know, I, I, I've always wondered if, if the Water Department would comment on this. What, is there any chance of damming Moore Creek? I mean, it, it, would that provide additional surface water uh, without any dangerous consequences? Um, 
you know, and, and, uh, you know, this, this idea that, that the weather and the rainfall is predictable, is that really reliable? I mean, we really don't know, right? What happens if you spend whatever it is, I don't know, hundreds of billions, millions of dollars and, and then it starts raining, you know, it like it will have been a complete waste. I love the planning. I love the, what the water department is doing, can, you know, uh, with their consideration for uh, what could be and, uh, you know, advanced planning. Uh, I, I, I just don't know if uh, major commitments, uh, well, for instance, I don't believe in major commitments to drinking recycled effluent. I, I'm kind of a real, real sketchy on that, <laughs> you know, but, uh, um, and, and as well as sharing water, when our water is so pure and wonderful and the uh, surrounding regions water, you know, it's not so great, you know? So anyway, that's all I have to say. Bye. Thank you for your comment. Are there any other members of the public here in person or virtually that would like to comment on agenda item number three, securing our water future resolution and policy guideline for water supply augmentation to improve water supply re reliability for Santa Cruz water service customers? Okay, I will bring it back to council um, and I will start with Council Member Myers. Uh, uh, Rosemary, thank you for the, um, for the really thorough and comprehensive explanation of really what you've done, which I think is pretty groundbreaking for a water utility to say, we're not gonna pick a project because our future is that unpredictable. Um, and it's, I think, something that um, I think will uh, really gain a lot of attention in California and other places in the world where, you know, utilities are often used to calculating a cost for a pipe and building the pipe and then paying the pipe off over a number of years with a bond. Um, and I think this is just um, really groundbreaking and I think it really will serve our uh, community well because of the type of water supply system that we have, which is slowly being retrofitted um, with all the major facilities being um, updated. But basically we're dependent on what comes out of the sky primarily. And with that un insecurity of knowing what that looks like, what you've basically laid out for our community is, is a policy that says, we're gonna be adaptable, we're gonna be strategic. Um, and it also recognizes that our use, our, our, our conservation has hardened, as they say in the business. We're not going to be conserving much, if any more water than what we are right now without some catastrophic economic and other, other uh, factors coming into play. So, um, you know, Mayor, I'd be happy to make a motion because I, I think this is really groundbreaking work um, and uh, support the, the staff uh, recommendation. But I, I think it's important for, for the community to really understand the shift that's going on here, which is we're not gonna be fighting over a water project any longer. What we're gonna do is acknowledge that we have to be an adaptable community and we have to acknowledge that our water use is pretty much uh, about as little as it can be without taking uh, major uh, drastic uh, actions are probably unsupportable in most people's homes now. Um, so I'm happy to make a motion when ready, but just wanted to just recognize the work and also thank the members of the Water Commission um, and especially those folks who have been there for so long, developing all these different parts of what makes up the story of our, of our water security here in Santa Cruz. And it's not something you do overnight. Um, and I also wanna recognize the work of the WASAC, which certainly was also groundbreaking at that point in time with the development of the portfolio options that have stayed on the books for a long time. So um, congrats and uh, thanks for your work. And Mayor, at the time, I'm you know, happy to make the motion. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Vice Mayor Watkins. I'm happy to second that motion. <laughs> 
doesn't exist done. yet. <laughs> uh, the, 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 yeah, the motion that's. I will move the staff okay. staff recommendation. I will second the motion. Okay, so we have a motion officially. Yeah. Council Member Meyer seconded by Vice Mayor Watkins. And I just have a few. And then we will continue discussion and then go to, we'll vote. I, I don't know if I could say it better than my colleague here, but just, you know, such appreciation to the work. Every time I sit and listen to these presentations, I'm blown away. Not only by the amount of thought and consideration and investment in where we are and all that we're going towards, but ultimately by how dedicated our community has been to this issue and, and the need for us to make decisions and to be flexible yet to have that, that common path and destiny. And I really appreciated that comment. I also just wanted to briefly add how I appreciate the recognition of public health, equity, and environmental justice being added. I think that we know that is critical and we can't av avoid that and we can't not uh, acknowledge that or speak to that or plan for that. So I just wanted to also acknowledge and thank you for that and thank everybody who, were, who um, brought us to this place today. And I'll leave my comments there. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you. Council Member Brown and then Golder. So oh, um, I, I do have a couple of questions that I want to ask in uh, kind of in the in the course of my comments because I, um, you know, I, well, I share my colleagues appreciation and, you know, respect and really awe of the work you do. Um, I, when I start talking about it, sometimes when we're here on particular items, I, I just feel so, um, grateful really that that we have such an amazing team and like I almost well up a little bit so I'm just gonna I'll say that I'll leave it there um, I'm grateful we have an amazing team too mm -hmm. and um, and I appreciate the the approach that's being taken here um, I I absolutely support it I appreciate the transparency and the process and um, the foresight and um, all of the work that's going into uh, trying to make decisions about a very, very much unknown future. And, um, you know, the climate crisis is real. We, the, the effects that might not have even anticipated even a few years back. I mean, even climate modelers that I used to talk to in grad school, <laughs> right, um, not that long ago. And so we are in this time of, of real um, uncertainty. And so having something to, you know, a, a blueprint for how we're going to move forward um, that's based upon all of this work is really so critical. So I absolutely support that. Um, having said that, I do want to um, raise the concern, which I share uh, in, in some, in, in many respects, about the way that this, the, the state, the goal statement of, um, supply without curtailment for all water users uh, does seem to um, sideline the conservation uh, concern. Um, it, language, right? So the language matters. I mean, I, I'm here and I'm working through this, and so I don't believe that that is in any way what's happening here. Um, but I, I, I do want to acknowledge that it's a concern that um, people have raised in the community, and it's one that um, that I share, and and I am very much committed to looking at a more a holistic uh, view of consequences, and not just econ I mean, economic impact to me is one piece of the puzzle. I don't believe it's the only factor on which we should be making decisions about future um, supply and the work that needs to be done to get there. Um, so I'm I'm a little bit. Um, I have some skepticism about that. And so I guess I just wanted to ask you, um, given that those concerns have been raised um, about uh, the conservation ethic and the idea that we should be um, communicating that to the public, um, one, how do we, you know, how do we do that um, in, in this context? What are your thoughts on kind of why it's not in here more, um, the language is in, in here? Um, more forcefully, and then um, the other question I just just flew out of my mind. So I'll leave. I'll I'll come up with it while I while we hear from you. Thanks. <laughs> um, I, I guess a couple of comments. One is uh, 
from my point of view, the billion gallons of savings from long-term demand management is stable. That's not going anywhere. We're not backing away from that. We're not making the assumption that tomorrow, if, if you know somebody reads this in the paper, oh gosh, the city did a policy that everyone's going to say, okay, well, I can do whatever I want now. I mean, sh shifts have occurred, right? People have changed their, their landscaping. They've decided to... Right you know, do something different with what has been happening there so it requires less uh, less uh, water. You know, uh, when, I, when I was living in Portland a number of years ago, the green lawns were the big thing. And then there was a whole new generation came into the neighborhood I lived in. You know, it was all the sort of turnover. And people wanted to go hiking on the weekends. They didn't want to mow their lawns. And so things changed. And that kind of change has occurred. And we've seen it because after 2014 and 2015, we didn't see the bounce back. And I guess what I want to show you a, a slide from um, a presentation that we put together for the, um, this was for the, uh, uh, the um, water shortage contingency plan. And so this is the difference between, uh, and all the different sectors you can see, uh, I'll make this bigger. Um, uh, you can see uh, between 2002, 2004, and 16, 18, and you can see that in the uh, the chunks of water, the difference between the dark blue lines and the light blue lines, and certainly the single family, huge portions of that is irrigation change, outdoor irrigation, which used to be the big target of the 15% routine curtailments, right? Uh, in the business sector, where we had some comments in the in the conversations about, uh, you know, they should just figure out how to get themselves organized so that they could deal with the 15% curtailment. Uh, they've already this has already been changed too. It's through regulatory changes. It's through retrofits. It's through not washing people's towels every day. It's the things that have been integrated, right? So we're making the assumption all of that is going to continue, we're certainly, and, but, but the <coughs> realities means that if we're going to, uh, if we're going to say we're going to do curtailment as some kind of routine part of our, um, of our d drought management tools, then we're targeting places where there's not a lot more to target. So the idea that people don't want to take shorter showers is like, well, it might not be that. It might be people saying, I'm going to take a shower every third day instead of every other day, right? I mean, honestly, that's kind of where we are. Um, so I, I, want to, I, I want to say that the decision about how to treat curtailment in the goal, it's a hard place to say, OK, we're not going to do that because it sort of fits that nice little warm, fuzzy spot we all have about how we want to do this. But the reality is doing a stage one or a stage two, it doesn't produce very damn much water. <laughs> and it has a negative impact on a community that already has adopted, embraced, and is not changing in any way that we can see from the actual water use data, their consumption habits. So uh, th thank you. And that reminded me of what my last question was. And, it, and thank you for sharing that, that slide because you know I've been paying attention to those big numbers and the reductions are phenomenal. And, and I recognize the, um, I'm a realist too. And I, I, I love it that you're a realist and I recognize the, um, that there's not that, the, the hardening of conservation is, has occurred. And then I wonder, I mean, I just, as a, a person in our community who talks to a lot of people who are concerned about this, and I notice it myself, well, there's a lot more I could do. And yeah, it wouldn't be my favorite thing to do. Taking a shower maybe every three days is not necessarily one on my list of things <laughs> that I'm thinking about right now. But, um, you know, like, I just, I don't, you know, how you wash your dishes and all the things, right? And and so I, and I, I can't even begin to, you know, envision what that kind of savings would be up against all of the yeah, measures marginal. that have been taking. Very marginal, very marginal, right? Um, and it's there, and people think about it. And so I guess I just, you know, I want to be responsive to right. that. 
Um, and I also recognize the wanting to be realistic or needing to be realistic. And um, so I don't mean to suggest that it calls into question anything that I'm seeing here. I just kind of wanted to hear a little bit more about that because you know people see this and this is work that's been happening um, ongoing here and there have been many, many opportunities for being involved in the conversation and um, we haven't heard much and we've been making decisions. So um, you know, being here at this moment, I, I'm not asking these questions to suggest that I'm not comfortable with the way we move forward. It's just um, wanting to be responsive to that concern and figure out ways to deliver a message. I mean, I'm just thinking even for myself um, to people about the need to really be thinking about this. I mean, we have um, limited resources. We just have limited resources and, um, and as you've said, not a lot of options. So, um, you know, and I'm not sure that tech, you know, uh, the technology is going to save us. Um, I'm not sure that anyone's saying that, but I, I, I'm less, you know, I'm less uh, inclined to put my eggs in that basket. I guess. Um, so, um, I guess I'll, you know, I, I think that's really the, the question that I had. I don't have specific questions about the, um, the material in this. You've been great about sharing that um, and moving us through this. Um, but I do want to just say that, you know, I think that this, we are going to be debating projects. I mean, this is a way to enshrine, codify, um, you know, a framework for making decisions in the future, but those will be coming to us. Yes, they will. And, and so to the extent that we think about what the reactions are going to be, and I know you are, um, you know, just finding a way to really be responsive to that, that set of concerns um, so we don't get into fights and, and blocked in, yeah. in moving forward because that's that's still a possibility no matter what we do here tonight. So thank you. Thank you, Council Member Golder and then Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Uh, thank you. I appreciate everybody's perspective. I also want to thank uh, Rosemary and the truly like global collaboration that went into bringing this forward. And I was really surprised to see that it was way back in 2003 that that um, desal plant was uh, that it was almost 20 years ago, and I was one of the people that was really against that. And having you know lived here my whole life and taken three minute showers since the 80s, I was like, I'll save more water. I don't care. I don't want that. And I think at this point, I see that that's not the only option, but that is an option that is something that I think is something we can consider. And like having this different um, portfolio of options is something that I think is responsible in in um, in that seeing that reduction of a billion gallons and and the sacrifices that we went through. People might not want to sit next to me. Maybe that's why they left, but I only wash my hair once a week. <laughs> and I, I hated to have to stop growing my garden in 2009, and this was the first year that I was able to have, you know, my own vegetables again. And then the other um, impact that really, I think, affected people was when we did have to let the sports fields dry up. It was super inequitable. And I remember Santa Cruz High had just planted a new field, and I can't remember how much it cost, but I think it was upwards of a million dollars. And those kids, students didn't get to play football or some of their fall sports that year. And they, maybe some that had cars could travel to South County to play on their fields. But it just, um, you think about our health and all policies, and we want to have those, um, pro-social activities available to, to to students and youth and adults in our community. And the sports fields is something that I, I don't think that that's a waste of water um, for people to be able to have that active recreation. So um, with that, I appreciate all of the thought and the time that went into this and truly appreciate all the time the water commissioners um, gave to this process. And um, I don't think it compromises our values of conservation. I really think that I'll, I'll continue. I, I'm not going to shower every third day, but I, I do appreciate um, I I'm appreciate all the it. hard work. Thank you. And um, I support this fully. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Great. Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Rosemary and everyone on your team. And um, 
all the commissioners and every community member who's participated in this process. My, my colleagues have um, stated it eloquently, so I won't repeat it, but um, I do just want to share that I thought what was presented to us both in the council packet and in this presentation were very complex um, uh, concepts, but in a, a way that was e easy to digest and understand. I'm, I'm not, I don't have a water background and um, I was able to understand it and follow along and really get what we're trying to accomplish. And, and what I see what we're trying to accomplish with what's being proposed is a yes and. Um, yes, we need to continue with conservation and we have to continue with conservation and that's not enough. Um, and the, um, the water efforts we have in place are are great efforts and that's not enough. So that's that's what I saw in um, what was being proposed and I appreciate that there's many options put before us. Um, I know we're not, that's not what we're doing tonight, but it's clear to me uh, what the options will give us and won't give us. And um, it sets us up for when the time comes for us as a community to make those decisions to have it be really well informed. So just thank you for your work. Thank you for what you've presented to us. And I'm absolutely in support of what's being recommended. Thank you, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Um, I think we have a motion on the table. We have a motion by Council Member Myers to move the staff recommendation, seconded by Vice Mayor Watkins. Um, and you know, I just wanna also echo my colleagues and say thank you um, to our water commissioners here today in person, taking the time, taking the time over the past several years and joining us virtually um, for the work and the time and the commitment to our, our city and our future and our water. And um, because it is uncertain, I think this policy and this uh, policy direction and the resolution is really good work that addresses Santa Cruz's water supply reliability. Um, and as the chair of the commission stated, we can continue to conserve water, but we cannot conserve our way out of this. And I appreciate looking, um, thank you to Dr. Rauscher for joining us all the way from Tasmania today. I'm sure it's the next day over there, but looking at ways to maintain our economic viability in this process is huge. So thank you for adding that and thank you for our health and all policies commitment. With that, I'd like to ask the clerk to please do a roll call vote. Council member Kalantari Johnson. Sorry, I. Uh, Golder. I. Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Brunner? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. At this time, we have um, our next agenda item is agenda item number four. It's a public hearing for an appeal of planning commission approval of CP 200068, located at 126 Eucalyp Eucalyptus Avenue and 136 Pelton. We will be taking a short bio break um, before we begin this item. Um, we um, will return at 6.15 to hear this item. Thank you. All right, uh, we will continue now with our agenda today. We are next up is agenda item number four, public hearing for appeal of planning commission approval of CP20-0068 located at 126 Eucalyptus Avenue and 136 Pelton. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting and joining us virtually, if this is an item you wish to comment on, now would be the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. <coughs> if you are joining us virtually, I will let you know when you can line up to the right of the dais for uh, public comment. This item will be conducted as follows per Council Policy 1.1. 1 
First, staff will present their report. Then appellant number one, someone on behalf of Opidian, will have 20 minutes to present evidence supporting their appeal. Please note this is regarding the appeal only. Appellant number two, Siegel, will have up to 20 minutes to present evidence supporting their appeal. There are two different appeals. Followed by opponent <laughs> responding applicant, appellant number one, will have 15 minutes to present their evidence opposing appellant number two's appeal and supporting the project. I will then call for public comment Appellant number one will have five minutes to rebut issues raised in public comment. This time cannot be used to raise new points or issues. Appellant number two has five minutes to rebut issues raised by the opponent, applicant, and or during public comment. This time cannot be used to raise new points or new issues. We will then return to council for deliberation and action. To get us started, I will ask Senior Planner Clara Stanger to give us a presentation. Welcome, Clara. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, Mayor Bruner and City Council members. I'm Clara Stanger, Senior Planner with the Department of Planning and Community Development. This presentation is about the two appeals of the Planning Commission's approval of a proposed assisted living and memory care facility at 126 Eucalyptus Avenue, project number CP20-0068. During this presentation, I will give a brief overview of the project and then discuss the concerns brought forth by each appellant. So the project site is located on the Oblates of St. Joseph property in the lower west side of Santa Cruz. The property is bordered on the east by Westcliff Drive, Pelton Avenue to the south, and Eucalyptus Avenue to the west. The proposal will reconfigure the site into two new lots, one on the west side and one on the east side of the property. The eastern lot will keep the existing church building and three historic buildings. On the western lot, the proposal is to demolish the two school buildings that were previously used by the Gateway School and to construct a senior assisted living and memory care facility. The city first received a pre-application for this project in November of 2019 and held two community meetings consistent with the Planning Department's community outreach policy. I want to note that the applicant has significantly downsized and revised the project. Um, since the initial pre-application submittal in response to both community input and staff review. So the new facility is a two-story building with 76 units, including 59 assisted living units, 15 memory care units, and two inclusionary, aka affordable units that are required to be designed, uh, designated as either assisted living or independent living. The project also includes amenity space such as a cafeteria, multi-purpose room, fitness room, salon, lounge, and operational spaces for offices and back of house functions. This is a rendering of the project from Pelton Avenue showing the parking lot and the main entrance to the building. The building has a Mediterranean architectural style and the development will be significantly landscaped throughout the project site. This project was heard by the Historic Preservation Commission on August 17th, and they approved the historic alteration permit associated with the project. That permit was not appealed. The project was then heard by the Planning Commission on October 6th, and they approved the non-residential demolition authorization permit, sequential lot line adjustment, special use permit, coastal permit, design permit, and heritage tree removal permit associated with the project. The Planning Commission's approval included the addition of several additional conditions. The city then received two appeals of the Planning Commission decision, one from the applicant, Roger Bernstein, and one from Ann and Robert Siegel and the citizens from the communities adjacent to Lighthouse Field. So I will start with the Bernstein appeal, which disagrees with an additional condition of approval applied by the Planning Commission 
that increase the number of required inclusionary units. I will so, now go ahead. Okay, um, so the municipal code's uh, standard inclusionary requirement for rental units is under section uh, 24.16.020.5.a and states that 20% of the dwelling units shall be made available for rent to low income households. Zoning ordinance 24.22.320 provides the definition of a dwelling unit. As you can see from the highlighted part, a dwelling unit must contain a domestic food preparation facility, also known as a kitchen. Zoning ordinance section 24.22.372 defines a domestic food preparation facility, AKA kitchen, as an area or room designed to be used for food preparation and that contains two or more of a specific list of appliances or fixtures. So to recap, the inclusion of requirement applies to dwelling units and a dwelling unit by definition must have a kitchen, which also has a specific definition. Only those units that qualify as a dwelling unit with the kitchen count towards the calculation for the inclusionary unit requirement. The project has 76 units, but most of these do, units do not have kitchens as defined and therefore are not considered dwelling units. 13 of the units have kitchens and are considered dwelling units for purposes of this calculation. The inclusionary unit uh, requirement is 20% of these units, 20% of 13 is 2.6. Um, and the municipal code requires a fraction of 0 0.7 or less to round down. So the requirement is for two inclusionary units. So the inclusionary regulations also have a section for alternative methods to comply with the inclusionary housing requirements. These alternative methods include various options such as land dedication, payment of in-lieu fees, et cetera. Um, one alternative method allows the applicant to provide congregate care units in order to satisfy the inclusionary requirements. Section 24.16.030.8 states that the applicant may propose to satisfy the requirement in this way. Then the approval body would need to determine that the proposed development does include congregate care units. And if both of those things happen, then the alternative inclusionary requirement would apply to 15% of the congregate care units. So the Planning Commission decided to make the determination that the project includes congregate care facilities and to apply the different 15% inclusionary ratio to all of the assisted living units, which is the units that the Planning Commission considered to fall within this definition. So the result was a requirement of nine inclusionary units as opposed to two. <clears throat> The applicant's appeal seeks to refute this interpretation, and um, this is the same position that staff has taken on this matter. The code clearly states that the applicant would first need to propose to satisfy the inclusionary requirement using this alternative method, and only then can the approval body make the determination and apply the alternative um, inclusionary ratio. So in this case, the applicant has not proposed to use an alternative means of compliance and has ins instead accepted the standard 20% of the dwelling units or two inclusionary units. So therefore it's not consistent with the municipal code for an approval body to apply this alternative method of compliance to the project. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the Siegel appeal now. Um, the Siegel appeal described a number of concerns, but I think the main themes that um, appear to be concerned about impacts to the monarch butterflies a disagreement with the location of the driveway on Pelton Avenue, and concerns about the project's consistency with the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA. So with regard to the butterflies, the appeal letter opens with the dramatic assertion, the murder of the monarchs. Um, Santa Cruz's monarch butterfly overwintering habitats are unique and they're special. Um, and I think a lot of people in this town agree with the seagulls that, um, that this is something that's valuable in Santa Cruz. Um, this value is also reflected in the city's general plan and the local coastal program. So general plan policy 2.4.1 and table one of the natural resource and conservation element call for development projects to complete site specific assessments for the butterflies and to implement general avoidance or management strategies when sensitive biological resources occur. 
So avoidance includes um, designing plans to avoid take of individuals and habitat, um, buffers to maintain suitable habitat conditions, actions to avoid disturbance from construction, and then management actions to protect from indirect impacts. Similarly, local coastal program policy EQ 4.5.3.2 requires development um, in the vicinity of designated monarch sites to undergo site-specific biotic review and for development affecting sites to prepare, prepare a management plan that addresses preservation of the habitat. This policy lists example criteria such as preserving or repl replacing, excuse me, monarch ne nectaring plants, prohibiting pesticide use, avoiding monarchs during construction, and keeping smoke away from roosting sites. So the project included an investigation by a qualified biologist. The biologist completed several site visits in 2019 and 2021. He did not find monarch butterfly habitat on the project site, but made recommendations to protect the nearby overwintering site at Lighthouse Field during construction. <laughs> So construction recommendations included um, um, retaining all roost trees, um, including buffer trees, buffering occupied roots by 100 feet, starting daily construction after temperatures reach above 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, that's the temperature when butterflies are able to fly around and avoid being displaced by construction associated vibrations. Trucks and equipment should enter and exit the site along Pelton Avenue from the east via Westcliff Drive to minimize vibrations and exhaust impacts to the Lighthouse Field Roosting Site. So the city subsequently received several comments from the public prior to the planning commission hearing um, that expressed concerns about the monarch butterfly protection. Based on this public input, the project biologists provided um, some additional recommendations for management actions to protect the butterflies. So the first one is prohibiting right turns out of the Pelton Avenue driveway. This is to prevent vehicle headlights from sweeping across the um, Monarch Grove at night, uh, which would only happen when a vehicle is exiting the site to the right onto Pelton. Prohibiting high beams until drivers are completely on eastbound Pelton Avenue requiring commercial deliveries to use the driveway on Westcliff Drive and across the church property rather than the Pelton Avenue driveway. Uh, locating new landscape trees to avoid excess shading of nectar resources. Shielding exterior lighting downward to avoid glare and illumination of the monarch butterfly grove. Providing an on-site water source such as a fountain for the monarchs. And then several actions to minimize predators, including installing and maintaining predator-proof waste bins, eliminating populations of yellow jackets, eastern gray squirrels, and rats, and restricting the use of seed feeders that attack predators. Also, um, use, utilizing leaf vacuums instead of blowers. And then finally, prohibiting the use of pesticides that are known to be harmful to monarch butterflies. So all these recommendations provided by the biologist are included as conditions of approval for the project, um, and they all fulfill the policies for monarch butterfly protection under the general plan and the local coastal program. So the Seagull Appeal also argues for the removal of the driveway on Pelton Avenue and advocates for all ingress and egress to take place from the driveway on Westcliff Drive and across the church property. Uh, the appeal describes several concerns about the driveway related to butterflies, noise, traffic, impacts to the roadway condition, and public access. Um, I've included a full analysis of this in the agenda report, but right now I'm going to focus on why city staff has found the Pelton Avenue driveway acceptable and also necessary. So first, uh, the subdivision regulations in Unicode section 23.24.030.5 um, describe that a new lot must have direct street access. The Westcliff Driveway provides access only across the adjacent lot to the project site. There's also a fire access issue. Uh, using the driveway from Westcliff Drive and across the church lot creates a fire access path that exceeds 150 feet and therefore would need to have a fire truck turnaround um, designed on the site to meet the fire code. This would require redesigning the site plan. The Siegel appeal also suggested 
retaining the Pelton Avenue driveway as a gated emergency access only, uh, but the fire department has expressed concerns that a gate would impede their ability to respond efficiently, given the number of trips expected to the site. Finally, refuse service vehicles will need to use both the Pelton Avenue and the Westcliff Drive entrances to service the site efficiently and avoid a complicated turnaround situation. So public works staff does not support um, eliminating the Pelton Avenue driveway either. With regard to the butterflies, I just want to mention again, the biotic review did not express any concern with regard to the driveway location and did not recommend relocating the driveway. I also want to touch briefly on coastal public coastal access because it's important for the coastal permit and the appellant indicated it was a concern with regard to the driveway. So this driveway actually already exists. It's a curb cut on Pelton Avenue. Um, so improving the driveway will not change the available on street parking on Pelton and it won't affect coastal access in that way. The project is also required to improve the sidewalk along Pelton Avenue on the property frontage and that will help to improve pedestrian access in that area. Uh, finally, I wanna note that um, senior citizens with special needs or disabilities is likely an underrepresented group of people when it comes to public coastal access and creating a facility for them right here will help to create a public access opportunity that otherwise likely would not exist for these individuals. Okay, so finally, I want to talk a little bit about CEQA. The Siegel appeal questions the Planning Commission's acknowledgement of the CEQA exemption and appears to assert that um, additional review of the project is needed to be consistent with CEQA, especially with regard to the nearby monarch butterfly habitat. So um, when, we've, when we review a project for consistency with CEQA, we first need to determine whether the project qualifies for an exemption from CEQA. If it does, then we're done with secret review and additional studies such as an environmental impact report are not required. In this case, the project qualifies for three different exemptions, so no further review is required under CEQA. And I'm just gonna describe those briefly now. The first exemption is under CEQA guidelines section 15305 for minor alterations to land use limitations. This covers the lot line adjustment portion specifically of the project. The second exemption is under CEQA guidelines section 15332 for infill development. This exemption is allowed when a project meets specific criteria with regard to general plan and zoning consistency, project size, location in an urban area, habitat value, traffic, noise, and air or water quality. I wanna note that um, the specific criteria for habitat value under this exemption is that the project site has no value for endangered, rare, or threatened species, uh, which the appeal letter emphasized, and um, I believe was uh, trying to express that, that it didn't qualify for the exemption because of that. Um, so, but I want to just explain that um, while the project site is near the monarch butterfly habitat area at Lighthouse Field, the monarch butterfly is not listed as threatened or endangered under state or federal law. In addition, the project biologists found that the project site itself does not have monarch butterfly habitat. So while we care about the monarch butterflies and we have local policies in place to protect them, they actually are not uh, relevant, I guess, to the infill development exemption under CEQA. Finally, um, public resources code section 21083.3 and the corresponding CEQA guidelines section 15183 provides that no further CEQA review is required when uniformly applied development policies or standards would substantially mitigate the effects of a project. So our CEQA review has confirmed that with the application of general plan policies, the zoning ordinance and other standard city requirements that are in place today, the project is fully exempt from further review under CEQA. Um, I also want to mention um, that our CEQA attorney, Jim Moose, and our CEQA consultant, Stephanie Strilo, are both here tonight, and they're available to answer any questions you may have about CEQA. Okay, so in summary, staff recommends denying the appeal of Ann and Robert Siegel and upholding the appeal of Roger Bernstein, thereby adopting the resolution approving the project with the proposed conditions and with the deletion of the inclusionary housing condition that was added in by the Planning Commission. 
This concludes my presentation and I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, I think I'm going to at this, are there any questions at this point? I'm gonna otherwise roll right into um, the first appellant. So I will now call on Roger Bernstein, who is here on behalf of Opidian, to present evidence supporting their appeal. Welcome. You will have 20 minutes. Please note this is regarding the appeal only. Uh, hi, Sonia. My name is Roger Bernstein. Um, so good evening, and, and thank you uh, very much for having us here tonight. Um, I have a question before, uh, before I begin. Um, I was going to... Uh, begin with a brief um, overview of our um, neighborhood and public reach out and then I was going to turn it over to another member of our party to discuss the appeal. Um, if that is okay, I, I'd like to proceed. Otherwise, I could just hand it straight over to our party, the other member, to discuss the appeal. It should be just regarding the appeal. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, I just want to say a couple things and then I'll turn okay. it over to... Uh, to Frank, I won't get into uh, in, in too much detail at all. And um, again, my name is Roger Bernstein, and I'm with a company called Oppidan. We are the applicant, and I actually live on the west side of Santa Cruz, on Pelton Avenue, just down the road from the site, uh, which, as you all know, is the Oblates Church property. I would like to start by thanking all the folks who have helped us get this project to where it is today. This includes city staff, elected and appointed officials, and our group of expert consultants and project team members. Um, I would like to ask if we could put up the, uh, I, I sent some slides through, at least the, the uh, opening slide is all I need. Okay. The city clerk is getting that up. Okay. Um, while she's putting it up, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and keep going. I would also like to extend a special thanks to all the neighbors, uh, all the Santa Cruz neighbors, all my neighbors, who have had extensive input on this very important project. I firmly believe that we have a better and more inclusive and more aesthetically pleasing project because of it. Uh, this project is very personal to me. That, that slide is fine. That, that's perfect. This project is very personal to me, not only because I live right down the road from the site, but because my wife and I have two parents who need assisted living services, and it would mean the world to us if we could have both our parents housed in the senior community close to our family and close to where we live. Senior housing and specifically assisted living and memory care Senior housing is in dire need in Santa Cruz, and we feel very fortunate to have the ability to bring this very important housing project to this community. Uh, interestingly enough, even though we're still a few years out from opening our doors, we have a significant prospect list compiled of Santa Cruz residents who are on a waiting list for themselves or their family members. With that, um, I will turn it over to Frank, who's going to go ahead and discuss the appeal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome, Frank. Hi. Uh, good evening, Mayor Brenner, uh, members of the City Council. Uh, my name is Frank Petrilli. I'm a land use attorney with Coblins, Patch, Duffy, and Bass here on behalf of Oppidon. Um, I think we're going to keep our remarks really brief. We thought that city staff, the city attorney's office, has done a great job. Uh, and the basis for our appeal is really straightforward. I mean, we think the Planning Commission really, or a majority of the Planning Commission, uh, was looking to get to a particular outcome, wanted to increase the affordability standard, looked at portions of the code, uh, kind of selectively quoted some stuff, took it out of context, and, and the result, uh, and unfortunately all of that really occurred after the close of, the, the close of public uh, comment and the public hearing too. And, and the result was a, um, a condition that increased the inclusionary requirement, uh, really did not take into account the, the pretty significant impact from an order of magnitude standpoint on, you know, the feasibility of the project. We think that the this is really not a case where the language in the code was ambiguous, or we think reasonable minds could differ about you know what what the interpretation is. The uh, again, our basis for our position was laid out in the appeal in a letter we submitted last week, um, in two staff reports at this point, and I think Clara did a really good job of uh, kind of covering you know what, why we think really the planning commission abused its discretion in imposing this this condition and was effectively uh, kind of making, you know, new po new policy, legislating really from the dais in a way that was not appropriate. So um, we don't have much really to add to staff's analysis. We're here to request your support to remove that condition. Uh, we're here to answer questions. Um, 
And we'll just close by expressing our, our gratitude and appreciation for the hard work of staff. It's been, you know, a three-year process. Uh, it's, it, the, the review has been exhaustive and extensive, and we're really excited uh, about the, the, the project at the end of the day. We're proud of what we've done, and we hope that the city feels the same way. Um, so we're here to answer questions, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I will now uh, turn it back, let's see, to, uh, um, let me pull up my notes. Um, so I'd like to bring it back and uh, welcome our second appellant, Ann Siegel, who will have up to 20 minutes to present evidence supporting her appeal. Um, before we start the clock, um, I do have exhibits here that, my, that we're going to put up. I, I didn't have access to internet, uh, to internet, and I didn't have access to do a... Uh, PowerPoint. So I did the hokey thing that we used to use, which is not technology. Thank you. And so he's going to just put up some pictures <laughs> that are not going to be marked into, into exhibits. So if you could just put those out, I'd appreciate it. We might need some more space here. We'll give you a minute to get Would those you? set up. Okay. So and then also I have a handout for everybody um, that we're going to do. Um, did you, did you, yeah, I think there's a handout of the exhibit. Is up there? Okay. Okay. All right. No. Thank you. All right. We'll start the clock. Okay. And where where is the clock? It's on the screen. Do you oh, see there. it? Oh, there. Thank you. Okay. okay. The clock is starting. Um, this is my first rodeo. I am Ann Siegel. I am a college professor. My husband, Dr. Robert Siegel, is a dermatologist here in Santa Cruz on Socal. We are homeowners in Pelton Avenue. Before I begin my, my prepared remarks, I, I think the community should know, a press if they're here, people who are here, that you have in your packet the agenda, and there are two documents in there. One is titled, Be It Resolved, The Appeal of Ann and Robert Siegel is Denied. All it needs is your signature. The other document says, be it resolved, the appeal of Watermark Oppendheim, or AK Roger Bernstein, is hereby granted. And so there won't be any allocation for, or any additional allocation for low-income housing. Um, I was a judge for 10 years. I reviewed piles of memorandum. And if anyone in my staff ever had the audacity or prosecutor or defense attorney to give me the document that dictated my decision, I would have tossed it in the trash. Yeah, you know, here, here's your guilty verdict. Just, just sign the bottom. Uh, no. <laughs> so I hope I'm not just up here reciting nursery rhymes to you, that you've already been told what your decision should be. Um, I hope that you will listen to my arguments and consider what I have to say. And that being said, also, um, under ethical rules, I'm not able to be representing Dr. Robert Siegel. He's going to call in. But due to the scheduling of this, as I has indicated, um, <clears throat> he could not be here. Excuse me. Oppenheim and Watermark are very well-financed, private, for-profit, equity investment companies that will put a lot of money into Santa Cruz for their investors. It's unknown from the document I've received what benefit they'll be to Santa Cruz, but they'll spend money. I'm from Tucson, Arizona, and Oppenheim has their headquarters there. They run uh, over 72 retirement facilities throughout the community. Oppenheim, Oppen, I think I'm mispronouncing it, Oppenheim, is the construction entity. They bring in their own crews, and they build the sites. Watermark handles the sales and services. We estimate they earn about $200 million a year, and their value, I'm guessing, just projecting from what they've sold, is about probably close to a billion dollars. They have a business model that creates housing for people living their last years, and it's for the wealthy. I understand that they find properties, they plop down new construction, 
the construction is self-contained that they put into a piece of land. Pillars on the East Coast, red tiles on the West Coast, they follow a formula, but not necessarily function. The neighborhood I live in, on Pelton Avenue, I'm new to the community, I'm happy to say, will bear the brunt of the construction and maintenance of the 74,000 square foot building. The site is adjacent to Pelton Avenue, a tranquil state park of Lighthouse Field, the home of the monarch butterflies, hoot owls, and many, many, many people. So I'm asking, as a condition of this appeal, that you stay it, that there is needs to be more study. Not to defeat it, not to say this isn't a good project, but just to stay it, to get more information. The first issue for the stay is an object need for an objective review of the environmental impact on the adjacent surrounding areas. The standards require an environmental review that is ensure, and to ensure, not estimate, but the protection of natural resources, wildlife habitats, scenic views. It's appealable error at this point because the project was not evaluated for the, uh, for the effects and the of the development on the adjacent coastal areas. The impact of the visual resources through an objective analysis on the surrounding areas as well as on the coastal access. This is a requirement under CEQA. The staff report considered the impact on the develop of the land itself, said it's an infill, has no real value, but the studies that they did contained very little information about the adjacent, open, wildlife-rich areas of Lighthouse Field or the impact of this project on the neighborhood, uh, on the neighborhood which is exactly what CEQA mandates. While removing buildings and planting trees is consistent with the general plan, there's been nothing that explains what is the impact on the adjacent parts of the community. There hasn't been a CEQA evaluation for years. They seem to approach the responsibility, if the staff seems to approach the responsibilities like there's a shopping center across the street or, or maybe a, a cement factory. I watched Coastal Commission re-hearings where they interviewed people who were looking at a bridge to see what the impact would be of the view of the bridge. That impact was not done here. We have a very special marine and land habitat in Pelton Field, and, and Lighthouse Field in Pelton Avenue. The field re provides coastal access to low and moderate income communities, to the park and to the beaches. The adjacent areas along Pelton Avenue and its threads of streets from Lighthouse Field provide generous sources to tourism due to an easy and open parking, countless sporting events. Pelton Avenue itself is a pedestrian walkway with a peaceful combination of walkers, cyclists, families, dog users, surfers that rely on this adjacent area to this development for its community value. Please look at the photographs. You see what we get to see you see what will be disturbed without further investigation. But drilling down is on the importance of the CEQA evaluation is the inadequate report that I do refer to as the murder of the monarchs. This monarch habitat is a beautiful, heavy tourist destination that brings lots of people here. But the primary entrance, if you look on your exam, and if you look on your exhibits, excuse me, will show you that entrance for their grand and beautiful entrance that they have, that they're going to bring in all these beautiful views, pops right into the monarch, it steps away from the monarch habitat. Now they did bring in a consultant, but the consultant that they had was not a butterfly expert. He was a biologist, but not a butterfly expert. But the CEQA demands would say, yes, we need to see what the impact will be on the adjacent areas around this field, all the way around down Lighthouse Field, all the way down Pelton Avenue. So the first aspect of this appeal is that I ask you to table this, require a CEQA evaluation on the adjacent areas, direct staff that there be mandate compliance with Coastal Commission, consider the impact on the public access adjacent to this coastal region. If you look at their overhead map, again, contained in this exhibits that I gave you, it also should be a mandate that all, during the destruction of all the buildings, of all, of all the concentration, be away from Pelton Avenue and onto Cliff Avenue, <coughs> West Cliff Avenue. 
as a matter of appeal, I asked this council to direct the landlords, the church, the landlords are the church, and the staff made the mention like there's two separate pieces of land. No, excuse me, the church owns both pieces of land. They're the landlords. They're getting a lucrative, valuable lease income payments from this. They're leasing it out and saying, oh no, but you have to stop here. And I'm saying to you as city council, it's like, no. You want, you want to get the financial benefit of this, you pay the responsibility to it for the community that surrounds that area. You want, you want to lease your land, good. But you don't just lease part of it and then say, but now we pretend like we don't own it. No, you own it. And through this lease, you give access through your property onto cliff that's already there. The lucrative lease should require them to bear part of the brunt of the vehicular traffic. And I ask that you direct that there not be vehicular traffic for construction or other vehicles on Pelton throughout this process. Let's protect Lighthouse Field, Pelton Avenue, and the onset of the development. The Coastal Commission requires study of the impact of this development on adjacent resources, as I have said. Pelton Avenue is part of the master plan that's contained in your exhibits. Pelton Avenue is part of the master plan now that is really in play right now because of the collapsing of Cliff. Of Cliff. We're seeing things falling apart with Cliff, and if you look at the master plan, which I don't know, we need to look at it, Pelton Avenue is an, is, is an essential part of that. So again, I urge you, table this. Stop this, you know, this, in, this all the hurry up. This, man, this thing's been going on for a couple of years. Nothing happened until August. And then bing, we gotta get this done. We gotta get this done. Why? We need to know, okay, now that we have some problems on Cliff, how is this gonna play into Pelton? How is it going to affect their ingress and egress? How is it going to work? We're not going to get the applicant or Santa Cruz planning and zoning to budge from this fiction that there'll never be more than 21 people on this campus at one time. Common sense will tell you it takes more than that to provide meals, medical care, activities, housekeeping, security, groundskeeping, maintenance, administration, sales, for the 80 people who will need services 24 hours a day, not just on the, during the week during a school day is what they keep saying, well, we're not going to get more than what was at Gateway. High-end elder care, which is what they provide, and by the way, they've never said how much they charge by the month, is judged by the quality of their staff. And it's a fiction to think that the planned parking of 40 spaces, including visitors and residents, is adequate. It's a fiction. They said they'll only have three deliveries a week, including deliveries from a refrigerator truck, and that the loading off Pelton will, quote, have minimal expected commercial trips to assure compatibility. What is the remedy to our community when there's daily trucks, daily ambulances, daily fire trucks, daily deliveries, 10 times what they predict? And I ask you, why should we trust their predictions? The applicant reported that their traffic study for this project done three years ago, indicated there's just light traffic on Pelton Avenue. And there'll just a few more employees is not gonna be significant. The report is flawed. We asked an engineer to review the report. The study performed by Keith Higgins was on Thursday, November 14th, 2019, 2019 was for seven hours on a cloudy overhead cast day with a nearby thunderstorm. Recorders are normally placed for seven days. Watermark conducted their traffic density for part of one day. Mr. Higgins used an outdated manual to predict future traffic studies rather than the 11th edition of the ITE chip general. The cost will be to us as neighbors and to you, the city of Santa Cruz, if we have to repave Pelton Avenue because of the heavy traffic that was reasonably anticipated. I ask you to do a feasibility study to determine if a trust fund can be created from this applicant to cover future damages to Pelton Avenue. Look at Pelton Avenue, you can see it doesn't exist. It's the, it has the structure of a, of a dying elephant. Uh, direct a survey of merit to look at pedestrians by traffic on Pelton Avenue. As part of the sequel report, we ask that there be anticipate, a study to anticipate the increased traffic on Pelton Avenue due to more trucks and ambulances, heavy equipment, require a cost estimate for using Pelton Avenue. The, also, the reality is I interviewed fire officials throughout the city of Santa Cruz. They said this 
is completely inadequate. Right now, fire trucks have to be, would have to back out onto Pelton Avenue to get out, and they're coming in and out and in and out. There isn't a valid, re responsible way to address the problems of fire trucks and access. It hasn't been, uh, hasn't been resolved. Table this. Demand more study. But the last and the most important issue, a 2020 reference reveals that the entire watermark project between Eucalyptus and Pelton Avenue lies within a tsunami inundation zone. According to the 2012 City of Santa Cruz Local Hazard Mitigation Plan and further confirmation by the DEIR figure 4.72 using the same map, there's a serious error in the environmental review of page that's described on page 52 in the packet with you under exhibit four. That review, flood hazard areas, indicates only the eastern portion of this project is located in a flood hazard zone and states no portion of the flood hazard zone has st residential structures. However, the map clearly shows the entire zone would be inundated by a tsunami. This is further confirmed by the map on, of an unmarked map of page 30 of Watermark's revised pre-application. We know that due to global warming increases tsunami danger, our coastal region is prone to earthquakes. As the Coastal Commission points out, land use must be done with exquisite care. Please reject the advice of our city planners. There's just too many flaws. Watermark and Oppendheim want you to approve their for-profit plan to pace 80 vulnerable individuals in a tsunami flood zone. 30 of them will be in a closed and locked building should a new tsunami building inundate the buildings. Watermark, this is your notice. This site is not safe for assisted living home, and it's your liability if you insist that this project continue. I think it would be wonderful if you build a retirement home in Santa Cruz, as you do it with a lot of class and a lot of cash, but just not in the location you chose. City of Santa Cruz, Abelitz, St. Joseph, the property isn't safe for development. Realistically, the property shouldn't be used for anything other than open space. There should never be a vulnerable population, school, or large gathering housed there. If the applicants really think it's a good idea to place 70 elders, some of them who would be trapped in a locked building in a flood hazard zone, do we really want them as neighbors? I could not find any memory care facility or assisted living home this close to a coastal region anywhere. Council, please table this project. If you sign that resolution denying my request to stay this appeal until further studies are done, I'm going to be dramatic. Are you signing a death warrant? We're talking about a tsunami zone. We're talking about retirement homes. We're talking about elderly people who could not get out so there could be a tsunami, yeah. And the last thing then, pouring across Lighthouse Field, if you look at this one picture, right here, or right here. Can you hold those up? I'm not able to see them. The last thing these people would see as they come, come and look at this beautiful view, and then they'll drown. Thank you. Does that conclude your? <laughs> okay, I'm now turning it back back to Opidian, who will have 15 minutes to present their evidence opposing appellant number two's appeal and supporting the project. This time may not be used to further address your, your appeal. I thank you, Mayor Bruno, members of the committee. Um, so, um, one of our goals when we started this project was to enlist a local team of consultants, contractors, and we've actually done that. Um, we have, right now, we have a local Santa Cruz civil engineer, traffic engineer, arborist, soils engineer, and two biologists. One biologist on our team, Justin Devilla, and one biologist who we've been consulting with, Bill Henry. Both of them extremely knowledgeable in the area of butterflies. We've also enlisted the assistance of several local contractors to advise us on material selection and estimating. 
Uh, there was a comment that uh, um, uh, it was a little unclear to me that we uh, are based in Tucson and have a traveling construction crew. Um, our head office is in Minneapolis. Um, my office is in San Jose, and I live just down the road. Uh, currently, we have done a couple of projects with the Watermark. We are the development entity. Watermark is an operations entity. Uh, they are operating currently one of our communities that we, we did with them in uh, Napa, California. Uh, we're building another one with them down in Oceanside in California. Uh, both of those projects used local contractors. The, uh, the one in Napa used a project that was based in Sacramento, used a contractor based in Sacramento. The one in, Ke in uh, Oceanside is using a contractor that's based in Solana Beach, which is about 10 miles to the south of that project, both local contractors. And as I mentioned, we are talking with local contractors here. Our goal here would be to hire a contractor from the, from the local region to build this project. Uh, a couple other things uh, that was mentioned, uh, they were talking about the, the photos. I think the, the, the photos, as you can see, it's a beautiful area. And, and quite honestly, we're hoping to, to bring seniors to this area to be able to enjoy the, the, the natural surroundings and, and, and beautiful views and, and the butterflies. We, uh, we take that very seriously and we, we can't wait to have our, our seniors enjoy those, those beautiful resources. As I mentioned, our, our biologist, uh, Ecosystems West, um, and uh, Justin Davila specifically is a, is a, is a very renowned butterfly uh, expert, as is Bill Henry. And, and both of them have weighed in extensively on this project. And I think, uh, as Clara Stanger mentioned, um, many of their uh, suggestions have become conditions of approval, and, and we've agreed to all of them. You know, we, as I said, we take this very seriously. Um, Let's see, there was a couple of things. So, so there was a discussion on uh, our traffic study is floored. We have our traffic consultant here, and he can address that potentially later. Um, they, they, we had the traffic study done. It, you know, it's, these, these projects take a long time. It was, all, was then updated several years later. And, and he also did a, a self using a cell phone data study, which was able to capture very accurate traffic information. But the bottom line is our project is gonna, del is gonna produce extremely limited traffic. I, I know there was a discussion on the number of staff members. This is an RCFE community. Uh, this is licensed by the Department of Social Services. It's not licensed by the health department. This is not a nursing home. They have much stricter standards for, for employee numbers. We are an RCFE community, a retirement community for the elderly, or residential community for the elderly. And uh, our, the, 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 the staffing requirements are significantly less, and we're looking at staffing levels of somewhere between 12 and 18 staff members at any one time. Um, so as you know, most of our residents don't drive. We have assisted living and memory care residents. So if one or two own a car, it'll probably just sit there in the, in the parking lot. Um, but we are really going to be, uh, we are going to be contributing extremely small quantities of traffic. This is a very low impact use. One thing that's interesting is Pelton Avenue. I can talk about this as a neighbor. Um, I've been walking my dog and riding my bike over to Steamer Lane for years. And uh, yeah, Pelton, Pelton Avenue appears to be beat up. It's a solid road, but it's, it's, uh, you have to drive it very slowly. And I've talked to many neighbors, not just in relation to this project, but just over the course of the years that I've lived here. And neighbors love the concept of the, the, the whole, uh, um, they, they love the rough nature of Pelton Avenue because it forces you to drive slowly. I'm sure many of you have driven Pelton and you absolutely cannot speed. There's speed bumps. There's one right in front of my house at Clark and Pelton and people, they use it as a, as a launching pad. But the problem is, is because that area of the, of the road is paved, it's smooth, and it allows people to accelerate. The area in front of our project, the area between Eucalyptus and Westcliff is extremely rough and it forces people to drive slowly. And people have told us they don't want us to go ahead and pave that area. Of course we would pave it, we would make it smooth if they wanted it. They don't want it. And I think Anne would, would know that if she'd lived here for a while. Um, but as I said, I've lived here for many years and they really don't want it. So um, I think that was it. There was a lot of discussion about you know tsunami and danger and all that. I, I don't feel like I need to address that. Um, I think, Frank, did you have any Anything else? I think that's it. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Okay, at this time I will call for public comment. I will look to our virtual attendees and also if you are here joining us in person, please line up to the right of the dais, my left. Looks like we have three hands raised virtually. I will begin with our first person in person. Welcome, please step forward and make sure the microphone is at your mouth. I don't think it reaches. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Um, my name is Craig James. I live on Pelton. I moved to Santa Cruz in 1953 and I've been away for a while but just moved back for retirement. Um, I support all of the comments by Ms. Siegel. I also like to say uh, that I support senior housing. My mother is in a place, is in La Posada over on Frederick Street, and I know Santa Cruz needs more senior housing, and probably need even more in the future. However, not at the expense of the neighborhood. And La Posada, I think, is a really illustrative example. I can only imagine back when it was approved that the developers said the very same types of things that my neighbor here said, that there won't be any problems. In fact, it's terrible over there. The fire trucks and ambulances come every day. Almost any time I go to visit, the parking is blocked by delivery trucks, whether it be laundry or La Posada's own bus that takes the residents out on, on uh, trips around town, that sort of thing. Um, it's a mess over there. The traffic, a lot of the residents, there's a lot of parking for residents, but it spills out onto the streets. There's a dozen cars that are parked on the street all the time. When we go to visit, there, I think there are eight visitor parking spaces. I would say 75% of the time we can't park there and have to park on the street. I can't imagine that this new development will be very much different. My father and my grandmother lived at um, Oak Tree Villa up in Scotts Valley. That was also an, an assisted living facility and a number of the residents there. The idea that only one or two people will have cars for residents is just ludicrous. That's just not how it works. A lot of people in assisted living are very active. They just need a little help with this and that. So that's a bogus argument. Um, the right turn only, the traffic on Pelton, I think the city analysis is wrong. Over at La Posada, there on Galt Street, there's a, no, there's a right turn only sign. It is completely ignored by the people who use that because it's more convenient to go out on Galt Street. Um, unless Your time the, is up. Thank you. Unless the thank city you. plans to station a police officer there, mm -hmm. traffic is going to increase. Thank you for your comment. I will now bring it to one of our virtual attendees. Phone number ending in 9700. You may press star six to unmute yourself. Go ahead and press star six. There you go, welcome. Great, thanks so much. Uh, this is Robert Siegel, I'm Dr. Robert Siegel, I'm one of the neighbors on Pelton. I'm speaking against this project. It's incomprehensible to me why the planning staff is pushing this project as much as it does, as it does not appear to be in the best interest of the community of Santa Cruz. In a facility such as this proposed facility, the public is not allowed to use the parking lots, the lobby, the cafeteria, the grounds or the garden, can't use, utilize the security, the nurses or anything. For the neighbors, the effect of having a facility like this next door is the same as having a busy factory right next door to you. This facility should be built in an industrial or commercial zone which has adequate streets, appropriate zoning, and room for the fire trucks and close to established medical facilities. Let me elaborate on that. I anticipate that this project will rent rooms to 80 wealthy elderly people, many of whom are not from Santa Cruz. These elderly will have trouble finding doctors. The town has a severe physician shortage. As a dermatologist, I myself am booked out for six months. No primary care or internal medic medicine physicians are taking new Medicare patients that I know of. If you know of one, please let me know because I'm looking for one. Who will be the neurologist and psychiatrist for the 30 patients with Alzheimer's or cognitive deficit in memory care? Further aggravating the healthcare situation is that much of the medical care in town is delivered near Soquel, a 20 minute drive from this watermark site, if you don't hit any traffic. Remember, there isn't enough parking to allow residents to have a car so they'll be, be dependent on a fleet of transport vans that Watermark will need to keep them seeing doctors. 
the site should be closer to Soquel and be closer to the major roads. It's been three years since the flawed traffic study was done on an overcast day in November 2019, which estimated over 250 trips a day in that low. Now with Cliff Drive collapsing, sea levels rising, the city planners are pushing this project as though there's some benefit to the city residents, which there's not. Please table this uh, resolution and obtain a new unbiased analysis Your time is of up. the project. Thank Limited you. Benefit. Thanks. I will now invite our next member of the public in person. Welcome. Good evening, <clears throat> Mayor Bruner and council members. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I am Father Matthew Spencer. I represent the Oblates of St. Joseph, the landlord of this project. Um, the Oblates have been on Westcliff Drive since the 1930s. We take very seriously our responsibility to be stewards of that property. We serve the people who live in that neighborhood. We've done that since we arrived, when it was uh, originally a largely Italian immigrant population. We continue to do that to the best of our ability now. Uh, I also take my marching orders from Pope Francis. I'm very proud of his stance on protecting the environment and being a good steward of the environment. I think my decisions at the shrine in recent years, including a large solar project, including a large protection of our gardens, which we make available to the public, I think it's a sign of my commitment to protecting the environment. We would not do this project if it hurt the monarch population. We would not do this project if it was going to hurt the environment. And I think the science shows that, uh, that uh, it won't. Um, we need housing. Uh, our congregation needs a place to live. This project is not being made for people outside of town. This is being made for the people who have been in Santa Cruz for generations. Uh, and I'm very proud to be able to offer that service to them. Uh, and just with that said, I think this is a fantastic project. I'm so proud of what Oppidan has done. I think they've done an extraordinary job balancing all the needs of the community, addressing the environmental concerns. Uh, and I just strongly uh, ask that you support this project. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. I will go to our virtual attendee uh, by the name of Dennis. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Dennis, are you able to press star six to unmute or the unmute feature on the webinar controls? There. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, welcome. Okay, sorry, sorry for the problem. My name is Dennis Hagen. I live in the 300 block of Pelton Avenue. And I'd like to say I wholeheartedly support this project. It is well thought out. It is well planned. Um, I would like to point out that the people who have spoken so far and opposed to it did not live in the neighborhood during the Gateway School residency at this project where we had hundreds of car trips per day back and forth. Um, Pelton is a busy, active area. Surfers coming in and out all the time during last weekend's um, festival or craft flair at Lighthouse Field. We had parking everywhere up throughout this uh, neighborhood. That is part of living by Lighthouse Field. Again, this project is going to have so much less of an impact on the neighborhood than the Gateway School did. Please don't oppose this project. It is very important. It's very good. And many seniors in Santa Cruz, 50% of the people in Santa Cruz are homeowners in the city. Um, when, when they get old and need assistance, assisted living, you sell your home and that's how you afford assisted living. It is not something that's cheap. It's not, unfortunately, something that everyone can obtain here in the United States. But this is a good, good, solid project. Please support it. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I'd like to invite our next person in person. Hi, welcome. 
My name is Blaine Halley, Mayor and City Council, and I'm here to support this uh, project completely, and, and I'm a little nervous, and I tell me how much time I have. I, there's a clock running. I want to try to stay. Two on, minutes. Okay, that's a little, very little time. I've got more to say than that. Uh, my family, I've been coming here since the 70s. My family lived 820 Pelton for two years. Uh, Bryce, Morgan, uh, we're ambassadors for the city of Santa Cruz, and I have been, uh, and I actually work for AmeriCorps now. I'm a senior companion, and, uh, you know, there's nothing like the area that, that this is. And I've just, family and friends through the years have come here to see the, the butterflies, to see the wildlife, to see the ocean. <laughs> uh, the shrine itself is open for everybody to go there. It's open for everybody, and... This is just a very, very special thing that I, I want to see this go forward. I've looked at the plans, and I know that it's the best that we can do, and I'm very proud of it. I'm, I'm proud to stand up before you, and I, you know, I, I think I'm just going to cut it short. I wish I could answer questions. I just, I, I hope that I've come across. I just very, very much want you to go forward with this and for it to, to be done. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I'm going to invite the next person in person. Hi. Hi. I've Can lived... you adjust the microphone? Sorry to interrupt. Thank Hi. you. I've lived at 105 Eucalyptus Avenue for 20 years. I was a direct neighbor across the street from 126 Eucalyptus when Gateway School was there. It was very nice to have the school there. Was there traffic? Of course there was. However, the weekends, there was no traffic. Summertime, there was no traffic. Christmas time, there was no traffic. So there was an end to the cycle. Uh, with a assisted living home, which I have worked at, I have worked at Kindred, which is on Capitola Road, there is constant traffic. It never ends. There are three shifts a day. I know what it's like to be at a place like that. It is busy, busy, busy. Also, uh, the butterflies cannot be contained just to Lighthouse Field. They flutter places. And, all, and so thinking that, oh, the entrance over there is far enough away from them, that's not really how it works. This is nature we're talking about. And also, the butterfly will be listed as federally endangered in 2024. Hopefully, we'll have enough that will make it until then. So I am, not in, I am not against assisted living. I think the project needs a lot more in-depth research, especially where traffic is concerned. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. I will go to our next virtual attendee. Uh, the name is Keith Higgins. Press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, yes, welcome. Hi, my name's Keith Higgins. I'm the traffic engineer for the project. And uh, I'm gonna make my uh, <clears throat> comments really short because I don't have anywhere near enough time to respond to all the traffic comments that have been made. But I'll just say I've been working around Santa Cruz for, over four, for about 40 years. I've done projects all over the city. I've done many, many, um, senior housing projects, um, assisted living projects all over the Central Coast. I actually work for, on projects at Gateway School. I have been inside Gateway School when it was operational. I've been there during pickup and drop off operations when it was there. We did counts at its new location at uh, Natural Bridges School for this traffic study so we get accurate comparisons. And that used to generate about 700 almost 800 trips per day. And this project will generate about 200, 250 trips per day. I did annualized averages of trips from Gateway School accounting for summer vacations. And the traffic is still much, much less on an annual on annualized basis with this project than Gateway School. Um, we've done parking studies and it is true that when we did the original count uh, back in November, uh, I guess that was 2020, uh, we didn't really have much choice because if we're called to do a traffic study in November and the report's due in January, 
you can't wait till the summer to do the counts. We had to do the counts during the window that we had our contract. But we did supplemental studies. We did a study on July 4th uh, that was dated July uh, 24th, 2020. And I'm going to run out of time. I'm trying to talk fast. And uh, we did uh, use uh, cell phone data and uh, we're able to come up with annualized. <laughs> And I'll stop there, but I'm available for any questions you might have on the traffic. And uh, I could go into a whole lot more detail to respond to a lot of uh, Thank you for your comment. I'll invite the next member of the public in person. Hi there. Hi. Um, <clears throat> my name is Russell Weiss, and my family has lived on Laguna Street for over 35 years. I have a couple of comments. Um, Santa Cruz is not lacking <clears throat> in assisted living facilities. We recently placed a family member in assisted <clears throat> living with memory care in two facilities in the county. There was no waiting in either facility. We also investigated a number of others and <clears throat> there was no waiting there either. The proposed development <clears throat> will be an exclusive facility for wealthy people who can afford to <clears throat> um, live next to West Club. Um, second um, comment, the service entrance <clears throat> for the development should be from West Cliff uh, through the Oblates property. The Oblates own the pr development parcel and will get substantial income from the development. <clears throat> Eucalyptus Street neighbors uh, and parkers along Pelton Street get nothing and should not be burdened with the traffic and noise. A fire department only access could be available um, from <coughs> um, Pelton Street. Um, and actually, if it was connected to the Oblates property, the fire trucks wouldn't have to back out or anything like that. Um, <coughs> the proposed development, in my view, is too large. Um, and I think other people's <laughs> view as well. If there were fewer than 50 units and an adjusted um, development footprint, I think there would be much more enthusiasm for the project. It's not that we're totally against it, but it's, I think, oversized and just not <coughs> planned the way it needs to be. Um, please support the neighborhood's concerns. Thank you. Comment? I will invite our next member of the public in person. Hello. Hi, welcome. Thank you. My name is Dennis Regan, and I'm at 101 Eucalyptus, and we've been there for actually 37 years. <coughs> My comment really has to do with the enormity of this project. It's very hard to visualize, and I really think before anything goes any further, we need to put balloons up. We need to do some things in the neighborhood so that people that aren't privy to being able to come to the city council meetings, because there's a very small distribution of mailings. It's a very small area. When I talk to people that are two or three blocks away, they have no idea that this is even going on. So I think that that has to be done just to give an idea to the neighborhood what this is going to look like, what kind of visual impact is it going to have in, you know, what is really a beautiful little area. And many, many people have said many things about the concerns that I have. Other than that, I just wanted to bring it out that we have to really look at the enormity and the size of this structure. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I will now bring it to one of our virtual attendees, Carlos Valdez. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Hi, uh, good night everyone. Uh, um, good night uh, mayor and uh, city council members. My name is Carlos Valdez. I'm a city representative for Carpenters Local Union 505. I'm here to talk about pre-qualification language and some of its benefits. Uh, I'm going to begin with apprenticeships. The structured apprenticeship programs are a proven escalator to the middle class, training tens of thousands of California residents every year and not cost to taxpayers. Because of increased wages and lack of student debt, construction apprenticeship can be a better option for many young people. 
that uh, are the what, uh, undergraduate program. Policy social proof qualification helps uh, helps to ensure that contractors hire apprentices and are doing their part to build our communities construction workforce. Healthcare. One out of four construction workers in California lack health insurance. That's two and a half times the rate for all California workers. Nearly 50% of construction workers rely on some form of public assistance. The lack of stable healthcare is a main factor that keeps workers away from the industry. Leading to the labor shortages that we are seeing in, uh, in residential construction. Local hire. Across state, major projects often import an out of area or out of state workforce instead of training and building a local construction workforce. Local hire policies help ensure that new development benefit all members of the community. So um, short words is pre-qualification language is a need that benefit all of us. Thanks. Thank you for your comment. I'd like to welcome our next member. We am here in person. Hi, my name is Kathy Pappas. And I am, my granddaughter is the fifth generation born on the west side. My grandmother was born in the early 1900s. And so we've lived in the neighborhood for all these generations. And we just want to say that we're really in support of this project. We think, you know, having almost all of my relatives still live in town. It's a good thing and sometimes a bad thing. But um, we all live very close to this area. And we just, I know about senior living. We know about traffic. We're business owners. And that's just kind of Santa Cruz. And I know you, you all know that because that's, you all live here and you all know that. So I um, don't want to say anything new. But we, there are a lot of people in support of the project. And it is expensive. There's traffic on summer days, in the middle of the summer, winter, weekends, everything. So there's all kinds of things that I know that you've taken into consideration. And I appreciate it all the work that you've done in all the different areas, because there are so many different areas that um, need to be addressed. And I think you guys did a really good job. And I appreciate the, the first report that she gave. It's so thorough. And so um, I've heard that a couple times. And she, she was very good, I thought. Um, and so I just want to say that, that we're in support of this for a lot of different reasons. And thank you. Thank you for your comment. I'd like to invite the next person here in person. Hi there. Good evening, Council. My name is Ralph Myberg, and I'm very happy to be here in person uh, in this world of Rashomon. Um, so I'd like to talk about a progression. Uh, when I first, as a neighborhood representative, uh, began discussions with Roger uh, Bernstein from Upper Dan, the, um, there were 100 units. They were reduced to 92. Traffic was taken off of Eucalyptus Street and addressed elsewhere. There were, used to be deliveries, et cetera. Uh, both the Oblets and Oppidan came up with a solution in which uh, commercial traffic could come off Westcliff and then return to Westcliff. We advocate that route and want it actually increase because of monarch butterfly habitat protection. Uh, so I would definitely make that point over here. Um, but the project was reduced to 76 units, um, primarily to accommodate a lower density, uh, greater setbacks. I will say that um, I've had deliberations with developers, and Roger Bernstein was conflict adverse and truly tried to accommodate specific neighborhood concerns and general community concerns. Uh, whether they have all been addressed is obviously in the province of the council. Uh, we did not touch affordability. Um, in terms of traffic, it would really be great for monarch protection, and we know they're endangered. No matter what the current status is, it's heading there. We know that. And any person who's been in Santa Cruz and seen the population dwindle and then just managed to survive know how precious this is. We need to afford the butterflies maximum protection. The only way we can add to what already has been recommended by the Planning Commission is ingress. And unfortunately, that's through the, uh, the Oblitz property. I know they would like to have some clarity for lots of reasons and not have uh, traffic go through their property, but it did with Gateway School. This is a much reduced version of that. 
It offers protection to the butterflies, and it suggests a pattern that I think this council needs to think about in the future. If Westcliff is turned into a one-way, then City Council needs to keep options open on how Thank this you. project is reached from Westcliff. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes our virtual attendees, so I'd like to invite our next in-person member of the public. Yes, welcome. Thank you. Is it low enough? Hi, yes. my name is Barry Michelle, and I live in the house next to on 140 Palton Only House on that block. And it just feels really huge. And over the COVID time and not all being able to meet, I feel like the communication is still like kind of, un. it's not coming together completely for me, but it just really feels like a huge project for that area. But, and um, I also really care about the butterflies and I care about whether I'm gonna be able to even live in my house for the time it's being built, but that's just me and my neighbor. I worry about them too, all the different neighbors. So I'd like to have more time to talk while we can actually speak to each other with us having an open meeting instead of meeting through Zoom. I haven't seen many of my neighbors for a long time, like only the ones right close to me. So thank you very much, and thank you for all your work. I can't believe all the work. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, the next person, please step forward. Hi there. Welcome. I'm Sean Medved. I live at 112 Eucalyptus. Can you my adjust house, the microphone, please? My Thank house you. is uh, directly impacted on two sides, so I've been involved with the developers and the community. And um, the one thing that I want to bring up is that this access on Pelton is really important. Um, and so it really needs to be looked at close because what it's going to do is all of the things that have been raised from butterflies to traffic, as it spins, spills into the neighborhood, all of us neighbors are going to be even more impacted than we already are by this massive construction and 76 units. It's almost unfathomable that we have a project this large in that neighborhood. I mean, it's, I, I would never believe it, that this would be, would be at this point. But the Oblitz and, and uh, the father spoke about how they really want it here and it's for the community. So if it's for the community, let's have them take a little bit more responsibility with that traffic flow. They already have a gigantic parking lot with two gigantic entrances. That parking lot is, is often empty. All the, all, we all live here, we've seen it. And if they can take that impact, I think that would be go a long way with showing, you know, uh, you know, good accord with the neighbors and taking the impact away. It, it all it makes sense for everything and it really needs to be looked at further. So that's my, my point. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Hi, please step forward. Welcome. My name is Paul Brown. I've lived here in Santa Cruz since the late 1970s. I will probably die here. <laughs> I love Santa Cruz. And, um, but I think taking into account that we are all uh, the town is growing. There's going to be more and more people, more and more people in need of these services. Um, even if there's ample room right now at these facilities, um, it's definitely not going to stay that way. There's going to be more and more people that need that kind of um, care. And um, why would we wait until there are no facilities available or that there are very few and it's, you know, very stressful to even find a place? So I'm in favor of it. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. We have a virtual hand that popped up, so I will um, go out to our virtual attendee, Ryan Meckel. Hey, good evening, Council. I uh, just wanted to briefly call in in support of this project and in support of the staff's recommendation. Um, it seems like this developer has been very attentive to the neighbors. Um, since the project was initially proposed, they've eliminated what would have been a third story, made the building a bit smaller and change the design of the project as well. Uh, I think this is something that Santa Cruz really needs. I think we need senior housing. And as they said earlier, they already have a list of interests. So this is clearly something that the community wants and that the community needs. Uh, as people grow older, they're gonna need assistance living. Not everybody will, but certainly a lot of people may. And this is a great opportunity for them to downsize their homes, maybe move into an area that's certainly beautiful uh, with the amenities that they need as they age. 
Um, so I just hope you'll accept the, uh, the staff's recommendation and support this project. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I'm not seeing any other hands virtually. <coughs> and does that conclude our in-person public comments on the two appeals? Okay. Thank you everyone for your public comments. In addition to the public comments we heard, 14 emails were sent to city council at cityofsantacruz.com. Um, I will now, um, each appellant will have five minutes to rebut issues raised during public comment. So um, I will call on Opidian's representative who will have five minutes. This time cannot be used to raise new points or issues, but to rebut any comments in public comment. Hi, Mayor Bruner, thank you very much. Um, and thanks to everyone for their comments. Um, a couple of issues on the, on the traffic study. Um, just uh, reiterating what staff uh, stated, that uh, we, we all know that there's a lot of traffic on Pelton. Um, the the uh, staff report, which was referencing our traffic study, mentioned that we're only going to be uh, adding 0.5 to 1% uh, additional traffic onto Pelton. The other, point, the other point that I think I just would like to make is that per the, uh, the amount of traffic that our project generated, per the ITE manual and, and some other methods that a traffic uh, consultant um, used, uh, we did not need to do a traffic study. We were below the threshold that required a traffic study, but we elected to do one anyway, just to ensure that we were complying with all the requirements. Um, try to keep some of these just uh, responding to the parking. Um, there was a question about parking and it's going to be spilling out onto uh, potentially onto Pelton Avenue and maybe around to Eucalyptus, et cetera. Um, you know, one of the things we did is uh, after our first neighborhood meeting, we redesigned the project. Uh, we took all deliveries off Eucalyptus. Um, and we, we actually, working with the Oblates, um, who've been uh, great partners, we, um, we are now taking all of our delivery access through the Westcliff Drive uh, entrance, the existing entrance on, West, on Westcliff. And that was something that someone said, why don't they do that? We are doing that. Um, so deliveries and commercial traffic will be using that driveway. And I think it's, uh, it's actually represented in the conditions of approval. Uh, regarding parking, uh, we are overparked uh, per the city's requirement for our site. We have 42 parking spaces. In addition to that, the Oblates have let us uh, build eight additional parking spaces on their property for us to use as overflow parking. So we have more than adequate parking for our staff, for our residents. And I, I know someone said that uh, you know assisted living residents all drive, or a lot of them drive, or some of them drive. I can assure you very few of them drive. Um, uh, it's, as I said, uh, my mother is in an assisted living facility um, uh, a long way from here, unfortunately. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the assisted living residents at, at her community, uh, I think almost none of them drive. I think a couple of them own cars and the cars sit in the parking lot. Um, regarding uh, our building size, as Ralph Myberg uh, mentioned, we using, you know, the, the, the mechanism for the neighborhood meetings uh, based on listening to the neighbors you know, we wanted to build a bigger project. We wanted to have independent living at our community. We downsized it. We had three stories. We downsized it again. We took, we took it down to two stories. And then through the, uh, uh, through the year and a half that it was in th going through the city process where they were analyzing any CEQA impacts on the project, we downsized it further. And you know, we've reached a point where we, this is, this is the size of the community. This is barely the size that makes it, uh, um, uh, effective for us to build. Um, if we had to start reducing it further, bearing in mind that we're, we're the, the, our lease, and someone said we're, we're leasing property, that's correct, we're leasing from the Oblates. Uh, that, was, that was said earlier on, and that hasn't changed. The cost of the lease hasn't changed. Um, but what has changed is the cost of construction. As everyone probably is aware, co uh, construction costs have gone up probably 30 to 40 percent. There was a construction person who called in about union construction. Uh, there's a um, Construction is, is very, very expensive. The other thing that's expensive is, is staff. Um, you know, there's a, there's a staff problem here, and, and we like to pay a decent salary, a decent wage for our staff. We like to, we like to 
bring on our staff members, and we like to retain our staff members. And if we don't pay a decent salary for our staff, they will leave and they will go somewhere else where they can make a decent salary. And these things cost money. The other thing is because of the requirements of, this, of the, the city and the neighborhood, and because we want to build a quality product, that, that product is, is very costly. So I just wanted to make some of these points that we need the 76 units to make this project work. Um, let's see, I think, oh, there was one other point, um, and uh, you know, uh, Sean Medved uh, was up here and he was talking about the project and the size. Um, you know, I just want to mention, I have actually met with Sean, you know, one of the things that we did, and I made this because I'm a neighbor, I made this a, uh, a, um, an ex a, a big part of what I did. I met with neighbors individually, and I met with Sean individually several times, and, and I'm sure he can attest, we have made probably half a dozen or maybe more revisions to our project to, to reduce the impact on Sean and to make it a better project for him and his wife. So just wanted to mention that. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll, um, our whole team is here for questions, too. Thank you. I would like to call on Ann Siegel. You will have five minutes to rebut any issues raised by appellant number one and or during public comment. And please note this time cannot be used to raise new points or issues. Thank you. I, I don't have a team. I'm here by myself. I'm new, but that doesn't mean I don't care. I care tremendously, which is why I'm here. I'm asking you to table this. This has been rushed. It's when it was busy, busy, busy two and a half years ago. I've never met Mr. Bernstein. I never participated. There's new people who live on Pelton. There's new communities. Why is this thing being rushed through? Why can't it be tabled? Why can't we have an environmental impact study? And I'm new. I found this location for seniors, or everybody cares and we want to best for our seniors, in a tsunami zone. The Coastal Commission Executive Director has issued a memorandum in 2022 that said if you cannot guarantee, guarantee there is no risk to people in a, in a flood area, you cannot build in that area. No one has said, oh, there's no worry about this. We're just going to pretend it doesn't happen or hope it doesn't. It's in a tsunami area. I'm scared, and I'm scared for the people who I'm here to, con to, to advocate for, which would be the residents who live in there. So that's not just, it's not just something that needs to be ignored or go away. It requires assessment. It requires study. It requires time. You'll say, well, it's a new city council. Maybe that's the point. Another reason to put it off. This is a future project. There'll be other people on council who may need to be responsible for stewarding this project through. The traffic is concerned. Parking's concerned. Watermark, I know this is good. But they just paid $17 million fine in kickbacks. Where's that message? There's, we need to table this resolution. The maps also show the fire trucks cannot get to the back end of the buildings should there be a problem, should there be an emergency. Why is there a rush? How can we know that what you're doing is safe? And that's the responsibility that you have as city council, is we got to make sure this is safe. What is the hurry? And they're saying, we want to do this for the community. No one addressed the fact that they're refusing to allocate more for low income. No, we can't do that. We can do two people. Oh, yeah, well, thanks. What about the other people? We're supposed to, the church got up and said this is for the church. Yeah, if you happen to make, I don't know, 12, 15,000 a month. They never mentioned how much the cost is, except that it is, it is expensive. It is expensive. The key word here is fragile. The environment that we live in is fragile. Our ecosystem is fragile. The monarch sites are endangered. I don't care. Saying they're somewhat sensitive is like saying they, they have bad manners. No, they're fragile. They're endangered. The neighborhood is fragile. Pelton Avenue as a road is fragile. I don't want to see it paved. I bought there because it's charming and rough and rural and quiet and and the elderly people who are supposed to live in this place are fragile. I ask you, council, please table this. 
Let's get more information before authorizing it and bullying it through. We are fragile. We're not carrying, we're not crows that can survive on carrion. We're fragile. We're as fragile as the butterfly wings. So I urge you to reconsider signing that authorization, signing both of them. Are you sure that you can't uh, demand that they provide low income allocations because the sink, because there's a sink and a refrigerator in the room? Really? We have people who are living in less than that, and they don't have enough money to give to Santa Cruz to say, yes, we want to meet all the needs of all the people, not just the ones who can afford to live here. We want to give a gift. It needs more time. It needs more space. We need an, we need a, 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 a environmental research that's viable and reliable and that has backbone. And I ask you to each have backbone. Table this. Ask for more investigation so we don't have to take it to the Coastal Commission to have them do the de novo review because you didn't consider tsunami, because you didn't consider the fact that there is an important CEQA evaluation that was not done independently and honestly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at this point now, we've concluded that part of the hearing, and I will bring it to uh, council for action and deliberation. Let's see. I see um, council member Kalantari <coughs> Johnson. You have your hand. Thank you, Mayor. I want to make sure you can hear me. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I have a number of questions and some comments and, and potentially a motion to put forward. Um, but can I ask my questions first? Is that, yes. Does that work for the process? Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, maybe I'll ask my questions to staff first, and then I have some questions for Mr. Bernstein. Um, uh, Ms. Siegel made some points around uh, inadequate access for fire and that she'd spoken to some, some fire officials. So I wanted to see if staff could um, address the, the fire uh, concern. Um, and then if somebody could address the tsunami flood zone concern that was brought up a number of times, that would also be great. Um, so let's let's start with those two questions and then I have just a couple more. Okay, um, I'm gonna have, go ahead and start with the tsunami stuff um, and, then, and then do the fire afterwards. Um, so regarding the um, tsunami zone, um, there's mapping in our local coastal program and also our general plan uh, for tsunami inundation areas. The project site is not mapped for tsunami inundation in the local coastal program. It is partially mapped in um, the general plan mapping. Um, so first of all, our CEQA review did look at tsunami inundation. It found that there is no impact because the, the developed, the part of the site to be developed is not within that zone. Um, and incidentally, I do wanna just um, clarify that we have an 80 page environmental review document. So this uh, conclusion that the, you know, the CEQA, that it's exempt from CEQA is not made lightly. Um, that is in the packet. Um, so I have a, a few other notes on the tsunami. So um, there are some general plan policies for tsunami inundation, um, but they do not relate to review of new development projects. They focus on warning and evacuation systems and emergency responses. Um, also, um, there are some zoning ordinance development standards um, regarding tsunami impacts, but those only apply to areas that are within a mapped flood zone for FEMA, and the site is not within that zone. And then regarding fire access, I have been working pretty closely with Tim Shields in the fire department, and he approved the um, fire access for the project as currently designed. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure what the appellant was speaking to about Okay. And maybe saying it wasn't adequate. Um, Tim Shields is present. Um, if you would like to hear more from him or if he has more information to add to that. That would be great if he could just um, chime in on that. Uh, good evening. Um, thank you, uh, Council Member Calentari Johnson, um, Council Members. Um, so the fire access issue was uh, specific, specifically brought up um, with access off of Westcliff. 
um, ingress egress off of West Cliff. Um, current designs did not allow for appropriate uh, fire turnaround or egress out of the site once we went in off of West Cliff. Um, fire stances, if they meet fire code requirements per the fire code, um, we would be okay with a West Cliff ingress egress. Um, the current design off of Helton, um, though it doesn't entirely meet the fire code explicitly, we made some concessions in terms of a wider access um, with a little bit extended um, of access in. But uh, in terms of access egress, egress egress off of West Cliff, um, the applicant would just have to show a, a design that would meet the fire code requirement. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that additional information. Um, oh, I see Lee is on. Did you want to add to that? Thank you, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson. Um, I was just going to um, add one bit to the um, response that Clara had about the uh, tsunami area. Um, and I was just going to share my screen quickly here because I did look at the um, the general plan maps and they're at the um, the citywide level. And so they're they're hard to decipher um, exactly, you know, where that boundary falls. So I, I took a look at the um, information. Hopefully you can see my screen here. This is the um, California Department of Conservation, Santa Cruz County tsunami um, hazard areas. And this is when you zoom into the site, this is Pelton Avenue here. And you can see that the tsunami inundation zone does cover the eastern portion of the site. That's what um, was specified in that um, the uh, 80 or so page environmental document that Clara referred to. Um, that document also mentioned that you know, with tsunamis, there's typically a substantial amount of uh, lead time in terms of warning time that allow, uh, allows people to um, evacuate an area. As, as shown in that map from the Department of Conservation, it's not, it is adjacent to um, but not directly in the um, tsunami hazard area. But nevertheless, there are those um, warning systems in place that allow for um, people to vacate the area if um, there is an expected tsunami. Okay, great, thank you. Um, well, one more question for staff, and then I have a couple questions for Mr. Bernstein, if that's okay. Um, can you just reiterate the... Um, well, I mean, it's it's in the it's in the agenda report. It's not really a question, but I well, okay. I, I want you to just go back and reiterate what the code states around the um, proposed inclusionary by the planning commission. Um, if you could just restate that for us. Sure, I could do that. Can uh, can I ask for clarification? You want you wanted me to reiterate what the planning commission had, how they had interpreted the code, how they had interpreted, and and why our um, staff found that interpretation to be incomplete or incorrect. Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So um, it was regarding this alternative methods to comply with inclusionary housing requirements. So the way that the code reads is that uh, the first highlighted part here, an applicant may propose to satisfy the inclusionary housing requirements of this chapter by providing congregate living units or assisted living units. And then second, if the approval body determines that a proposed residential development includes congregate living units or assisted living units, the following alternative requirements shall apply. And then it explains that 15% ratio for the congregate care units. So. What the planning commission did was they just took this second sentence if the approval body determines so they decided to make the determination on their own that this project includes congregate living units or assisted living units and so they applied this 15 percent um, inclusionary requirement but um, this first sentence was i guess it's the, the second sentence and that was actually the third mm -hmm. but this first sorry this uh, the previous sentence was um i guess disregarded um, but really the way the code reads is that both of these um, things need to be satisfied in order for this 15% um, alternative requirement to kick in. So first, the applicant would need to propose to satisfy the inclusionary housing requirements with this alternative method of compliance. 
And then if they propose that, at that point, the approval body would determine whether there are indeed congregate living units or assisted living units that would then qualify for that lower 15% inclusionary rate as opposed to the standard 20%. So in this case, the applicant did not propose mm -hmm. to um, do this alternative method. They just they just chose to do the standard compliance, which is 20% of the dwelling units, mm -hmm. which are the units with the kitchens. And this was information that the Planning Commission had Correct. Before yes. They made their decision. Okay. Yes. Thank this you. was in thank the analysis you. in the staff report. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. And then I just have um, two questions for Mr. Bernstein. If um, if you could come up, um, if you, Mr. Bernstein, yes. if you want, you wanted to, to speak to the community engagement. Could you just very briefly, in thirty seconds, tell us the um, how long you've been working on this project and what specific actions you took for community engagement? Um, sure. Yeah, we've been working on this project for uh, about three years now. Uh, we had uh, we had our first um, neighborhood meeting, which was attended by over a hundred folks. It was li it was a live meeting, which was nice um, in early 20, 2020. Um, based on the feedback from the neighborhood, uh, we made very significant changes, including uh, reducing the size of the building. But one of the most important things is we had made an assumption because the lighthouse, uh, the school that was on light, excuse me, on uh, on uh, Eucalyptus Avenue was using Eucalyptus as a loading area. We made an assumption that we could use that for our loading. That was uh, um, the neighbors uh, did not like that, and so because of that, we closed all loading activities on Eucalyptus Avenue, and moved our loading access to come in through uh, Westcliff. And then we moved our loading area to the southeast corner of our building, which was the area furthest away from all residences. Then we had a second neighborhood meeting. We presented that. Uh, unfortunately, that was a virtual meeting, but it was also attended by, I would say, 60 to 80 uh, neighbors. And it was extremely well received, uh, the changes that we made. Um, based on uh, the uh, reception that we got there, we then uh, submitted our project for a, with a formal application to the city. But over the, the next year and a half, including up until even several weeks ago, we have continued to work with neighbors. I think Ralph Myberg mentioned that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, he's a neighborhood representative. I'd be meeting, I've been meeting with Ralph probably uh, every other month for a year mm -hmm. and a half, getting feedback from neighbors. I've also met with individual neighbors, not all neighbors, not every neighbor, because I, I met with neighbors who reached out to me um, I walked na the neighborhood, and if people came up to me, I answered questions. But we continue to make changes, and we downsized the project again. And at that time, we reduced, we eliminated the third floor and went to a two-story building. And by eliminating the third floor, we eliminated, and it was unfortunate, our independent living units, which mm -hmm. also not only made the building smaller, but reduced the impacts and reduced the parking requirements and traffic. Thank you. Um, and then I just, my other question is uh, around the um, inclusionary units. So it's, it's clear that you did not propose an alternative method. Um, uh, and and um, so you, you chose to go with a 20% inclusionary of the units that are dwelling units, dwelling as we just units. heard again right. from, this, from the staff. Um, and my assumption is that if your appeal was denied, uh, you can speak for yourself, but would this po would this project be feasible if we move forward with planning commission's recommendation with it, it the additional? It, it would okay. not. We could not move forward with this project. Um, so my next question, maybe last question to you, is um, with the twenty percent inclusionary of the thirteen units that qualify, um, it's the two point six. Am I right? Two point. That's correct. Yes. Two, yeah, it and, rounds up two point six. That's correct. And so um, we're required, or we typically round down. So there's two units. Would it be feasible for the project to round up and make it three units? Is that something that you would consider? Yeah, we could consider that. Yes, that's okay. correct. Okay. Thank you. Those are my questions, um, Mayor. I have some comments and then a motion, if that's okay. 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 Um, and I know others will probably want to speak, so I'll keep it quick. Um, so I, I really want to just appreciate everyone who came out tonight, um, either virtually or in person. I'm sorry that I'm not there in person. Uh, I want to appreciate and thank um, everyone who's been engaged in the last couple of years. This is also my neighborhood. I'm very familiar with the area and take my dog out for a walk there almost daily. 
Um, so I understand the concerns around impacts. And it's, it's very clear to me that um, this applicant has worked extensively with the neighbor, um, has, as was just reiterated, really met a lot of the neighbor's needs. We heard from some speakers that we have a, a tremendous need for senior housing. As I've talked to community members, I hear a lot from people who are my age in their 40s that they have parents living in single family homes that they cannot leave because they don't have another place to go to. So if they leave their single family homes, this will open it up to families of three, four, five, um, and they would get the assisted living that they need. So there's a need in the community. Um, I, I, I think that this is the way that we want to roll out projects is to engage deeply with the neighbors, is to make changes, is to bring in experts from the field, the biologists that were named by Mr. Bernstein. Um, I know some of them, they're very reputable experts in our local community that have been doing the work. Um, so these are the aspects of a project. Um, unfortunately, not all projects that come to us um, go through this process, but these are the aspects of a project that will make it a successful project. Um, and um, you know, to, uh, I'll just briefly say that it, it, it's clear from the staff report and the presentation what we heard from Mr. Bernstein that this alternative method that the planning commission, the planning commission ignored that the alternative method can't be applied unless the applicant proposes it. And the applicant did not propose it. And we just heard from Mr. Bernstein that the project would die. It would be killed if we impose this condition. Um, so if that's the um, intent of the commission to kill the project, that's another story. I don't think it necessarily is. Um, and I think this is a good project. There's a need in our community. So with that, I would like to move staff recommendation. Um, and I can read it if you'd like. With the added condition, to round up the 20% um, inclusionary from two units to three units. So I can, would you like me to read the staff recommendation, Mayor? Yes, yeah, so, um, yes. We right, have a motion um, by Council Member Kalantari Johnson. And so I'll, go oh, sorry, ahead. I'll move resolution denying the appeal of Ann and Robert Siegel and upholding the appeal of Roger Bernstein, thereby adopting the resolution approving the non-residential demolition authorization permit, sequential lot line adjustment, special use permit, coastal permit, design permit, and heritage tree removal permit to reconfigure five lots into two, demolish two existing school buildings, approximately 28,417 square feet, remove six heritage trees and construct a 76 unit, including 13 full dwelling units, senior housing facility as approved by the planning commission, but the deletion of condition of approval 60, and then with the addition of condition of approval of adding one extra um, affordable unit, making it a total of three. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second that. Vice Mayor Watkins is our second um okay does that conclude we have yes, a motion on the table thank you and um i will now bring it out for further discussion um council member brown you had your hand up well i um i actually had a question for mr bernstein as well um my question is is trying to get a little bit more detail on the flat flat out if, if you had to comply with a more higher inclusionary percentage would the project be feasible my the answer is obviously no because you wouldn't be here appealing <laughs> if that weren't the case um, but I wanted to um, I wanted to see if I, if I could just hear a little bit more about the um, that challenge for you because um, I'm still weighing the way that the Planning Commission interpreted our rules, and, and I would argue that um, there's some, uh, some gray areas in our, our zoning code that um, leave this open, a little bit more open to interpretation um, than, than what I'm hearing. Um, so what I'd like to know is, um, in, your, in your analysis, um, that two units out of 76 was going to meet the minimal requirements. Um, 
did you contemplate additional units at all at any point, additional inclusionary units at any point? Um, and I'd just like to understand better how it's, it's impossible, like I'm, what I'm hearing is it's impossible to do this unless, you know, without, I guess three now, so, you know, instead of two and a half, three um, units on a 76 unit project. Um, and so I also am tr I'm trying to understand the, um, if you could just tell me more about how that will make it infeasible to do any more f affordability. I, m my goal in being here is representing the public interest, I believe. It's in the public interest to maximize our affordable units in these projects. Um, we don't have, um, you know, a lot of tools for that, and this is one of them, our inclusionary ordinance, um, which has been eroded. I'll leave it there on that one. But can you just talk a little bit more about wh what makes it infeasible to, um, you know, provide additional affordability and, um, like, at what level? And, it, and then I'm also trying to understand if they're not congregate units and they're not dwelling units and they're not assisted living units, what are the other units going to be? And th those are all just exempt. I'm, I'm still unclear about that. So if you could help me understand. Let me try to explain. First of all, that we did have more affordable units in the project when we had more units overall. I think at one point we had four affordable units when we had a project of 92, 92 total units. What we do when we, when you know, and it's there's a, there's a lot that goes into this, and I, I, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm, I run our construction group. I'm not a finance expert, um, but what we do is we, when we run a pro forma, we back into sometimes we'll back into a into what we, we, can, we can build in order to give, make a project have a feasible return. We are not a non-for-profit uh, uh, company, but um, we're not looking to try to uh, you know, pillage the community. We, we need a project that's gonna, give, uh, that's gonna give us a decent return. One of the things that we have to do is we also have to appease, just like all of you do, we have to appease our banks, our lenders, and financial partners, et cetera. So you know, the, project, the project has to be feasible. What we did on this particular project is we did we did what they call like a reverse engineering, and I, I use engineering because I'm more I'm an architect actually, so um, I have to think in those terms. But we reverse engineered it so that we figured out that we could we could reduce the project down to essentially 74 uh, uh, market rate units and two affordable units, and the project still worked. What we did do is we did that calculation about a year and a half ago, uh, maybe a maybe a little less, maybe a year and a, a quarter ago. But we, what we did not take into account was a, a tremendous escalation in construction costs. Really, you know, all things were equal, but construction costs continued to go up. You know, they went up, I think, I would say in last year, construction costs went up about 30%. Now, they, you know, some things came down a little bit. You know, the price of lumber came down a little bit. And so there were some things that started to balance out, but they did not. And they, typically, that's what I've seen through my many years of of building is is they uh, they don't come back to their original costs. So in order to make the project work, we had to we had to we had to try to play this little game of it's I don't know if it's really called chess or you know whatever you would call it. We move pieces around, and we figured out that the really the only way we could make this work was 74 market rate units and two affordable units. And then when we went to, and and we actually and we relied on on uh, staff and the city attorney advising us that we were meeting code. Then we went to the Planning Commission, and uh, uh, the Commissioner Schifrin um, uh, added this condition. So we immediately went back and we started doing the same thing, this reverse engineering to figure out, boy, can we, can we add all these units and still make it work? And we looked at it, and, and to be honest, I mean, we, they approved the project. We, didn't, we weren't about to try to appeal our own project if it worked. It, it didn't work. Financially, the returns weren't there. We wouldn't be able to go get a lender. We wouldn't be able to get a financial partner. And it would not it would not work for us, so we did start looking at you know what what might work you know could we add one could we add two and and unfortunately the threshold was we could potentially add one our hope and and you know hope is a terrible strategy I tell people that all the time our hope is that construction costs don't start uh, you know escalating next year like they did last year um, I don't think they will um, it seems like things are starting to flatten out I've talked to, I'm I'm continuing it as I mentioned I'm working with local contractors. And I'm talking to them, and they're telling me that the price of steel, the steel commodity prices are still down. What is what has continued to go up is fuel costs and labor. Labor and, and fuel are still are, are extremely expensive. Fuel's leveled out. Labor has not. So you know, construction costs are incredibly expensive, and unfortunately, we're 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 at a position where 
you know, I, I'm pretty sure we can make it work with three affordable units. I don't think we could make it work with any more. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and my other question then just being, and again, I'm, maybe I'm just really dense. I've read through all these materials and I've really been trying. Um, what are you calling those other units that are not considered so, residential? What are they going to be if they're not congregate and they're not dwelling units? So we, we, are, we are planning on building a community of assisted living and memory care units. You know, I don't know if it's the, the semantics of what, what we're calling them. My understanding is, based on the city, the city code, um, we were required to provide 20% um, of the um, of units that would be would qualify as dwelling units. And there were there was a specific definition around what would qualify as a dwelling units, and it had to it related to kitchens. <laughs> And then there was, there was a discussion with staff about what constitutes a kitchen. And there was two or more appliances, and there was some other things. So you know, we, uh, um, in a lot of our communities are assisted living communities. We don't have any kitchens. We might just have a refrigerator, or just a microwave, or just a sink. Um, we elected to go ahead and, and try to put in these, you know, a couple of small kitchenettes, a few small kitchenettes. But it's really just two or more appliances. Um, on our, in, a, in these communities, um, typically most of our residents come down to the, the dining room for, uh, for their meals. If they cannot, if for some reason they're sick, they're not ambulatory right now, they have their meals brought to their room. It's very rare that any of our residences, uh, in assisted living residents, um, prepare their own meals. They might heat something up in a microwave, they like to have a sink to wash their hands or wash a cup of coffee for a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, etc. So we're calling them assisted living and memory care. But I think our, our primary uh, discussion with staff is what is what is the city charter? What does the city code require? And, and we were told early on that the way we interpreted the project was, was a code compliant project. And we relied on that. And we were told that by the city attorney as well. And then that was continued to be that was that was continually reinforced down the line. So we relied on that to design our project. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm just going to say that um, I, I, I recognize the frustration in um, being told that you're compliant and then having these kinds of questions come up. Um, this is not the first time that I have disagreed with the staff's interpretation of our inclusionary policies. Um, so um, I'll just leave it there. But I appreciate you trying to help me understand the Sure. realities of your sure. I mean, circumstances. It, it, the reality is I think we can do three units, um, whatever the, the, your policy states. I, mean, I, that's, I think that's probably the limit that we can do to make this project work for us. Thanks. Does that conclude your questions? Uh, Council Member Myers. I'm, I'm looking at the, um, the uh, site plan drawing. Can you describe a little bit better to me where are people coming in and out of the drive uh, in and out of the parking lot because I see um, so I'm looking at the drawing I have a site plan um, if you could put it up because it well, looks I have a, like I have a site plan of our project yeah. it's, uh, if, uh, it was on the uh, in the that what I submit sent to staff this afternoon. Okay. Yeah, it uh, was the. Um, there's a site plan. I sent two packets. There's a, there's there's a site plan, not the addendum, the other one, the other packet. Figure two and the. There we go. So go forward, go forward a little more. Keep going. Next one. Right there. Okay, that's that's our current site plan. That shows uh, all of our current tweaks and changes that we made even after we submitted to to the city. Um, Right now, our primary access for vehicular access is off Pelton Avenue. It's the existing curb cut off Pelton. It's, it's, it's drawn in there in, in orange. You can see there on, on Pelton Avenue. Yep. Um, that would be our, our primary access for, for vehicles um, into our parking lot. And then we have, uh, we've added a um, paved drive that connects our parking lot with the Oblates parking lot. And then you can see the sign that says added parking and mm -hmm. access drive from Westcliff. Those are the eight parking spaces that we're, we've added. That area right now is dirt. Um, so we've right. added those eight parking spaces. And then if you continue to go to the east, 
North is up the page, so it makes it pretty oh. easy. If you can need to go to the east, there's an existing gate there on. Oh, that's, um, my, that's my question. On, is what's going to go on with that gate? Yeah, so that, that's going to be our delivery entrance and exit. And so, is that going to be open and closing just only for deliveries, or is that going to be available for people to come in off of West Cliff? It's really just for, it's for deliveries. It's for deliveries and commercial vehicles, so trash uh, uh, deliveries, um, and, and potentially uh, fire and, and, and ambulances could use that as well. An ambulance coming into the site could potentially use that. And the, the entrance a little bit further north past the, uh, the meditation garden, that typically, I live in the area too, so yeah. I, I know the area well, that typically is open because of the cafe. Right. Do you imagine that is also going to be just remaining open during the day? Yeah, we haven't, we haven't planned uses? on using that access yeah. point at all. Again, okay. we're, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to have anywhere between 12 and 18 staff members here. Most of our residents don't drive. We get a couple of deliveries a day. Um, we get some visitors. All of you know that, uh, you know, if, if, who have family members at, at these communities, you'd think they get a lot of visitors. They really don't. It's unfortunate, but they really don't. Um, okay. So, but uh, the, the, vehic the vehicle traffic uh, will come in and out um, off, off Pelton, and then we're going to have a sign um, on uh, in facing our parking lot that's going to require uh, our uh, visitors and, and anyone and staff members, anyone using that access point on Pelton to exit and make a left turn onto Pelton and head straight back out onto Westcliff. That way they don't drive down Pelton, they don't add any traffic, even though there's almost no traffic from this community, they don't add any of our limited traffic westbound on, on Pelton. Um, and they don't shine the, their headlights on the butterfly grove. Mm -hmm. Okay. I I guess my one consideration. I don't. I'm not. I don't think I feel like I have to make this a condition of approval. But I hope there's evaluation. I guess as you know, as you continue through the and if and if upon starting for the facility to open, I think this. Um, this lower entry there, um, closer to the corner of Westcliff and Pelton, that's going to be gated. I have the feeling that will become a, a very popular way for people to come in and out of your facility, potentially. Um, just my, my knowledge of living there for a long time is, um, you know, I, I'm not sure that people are going to make the turn on Pelton if they can if they can potentially make a, you know a straighter shot right in off of Westcliff right before the stop sign. So um, I won't make it a I won't change the motion to make it a condition of approval. But um, you know, I, I think uh, just for the staff's um, thoughts as you move forward through this, um, maybe give that some consideration. Um, the the main thing I've heard is. Um, and I do see the issue there with the adjacency to the stop sign, but um, I'm just curious to see how all the parking and moving through the parking lot is going to work. Um, but um, just um, thank you for the explanation sure. of the circulation. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, I have Council Member Cummings and then Council Member Golder. I don't really have, and again, sorry, I'm getting over a cold, so my voice is not that strong tonight, but I'm going to, I'd like to make a couple comments on this. Um, first, I just want to thank all the members of the public who came out to speak, um, either for or against this project, but it's great for us to be able to hear your concerns, to be able to hear, uh, hear all of you out as we uh, deliberate on this item that's before us. Um, you know, I'm not, not in opposition to the project, but... Um, I, th I have some serious concerns with the affordable housing components and some of the impacts that have been brought up this evening, but in particular to kind of what I've, I've been hearing in this discussion around the affordable housing because it sounds like, you know, the, the city council is making a, a very strong effort at trying to maximize the amount of affordable housing because we are in a housing crisis in this community. And it sounds like what happened was that the developer talked about what they could make happen, went to the staff, and then the staff said, okay, well, based on what you can do, you can provide us with two affordable units, and then the rest of this is market rate, which what we should be doing is trying to figure out how we can maximize the amount of affordable housing, and if it turns out 
there's not enough money, you can't make a pencil out, well then we should be working together to figure out how we can finance and find funding for those other units. Um, and I'll just say, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but reading the code that's before us and going over that language multiple times, um, I'm really concerned if this gets appealed to the Coastal Commission or if somebody wants to you know, bring forward this language because it's pretty clear that there's no requirement that the applicant, um, they, can, they may propose to satisfy the inclusionary requirements by providing congregate units or assisted living units, but it's not a requirement for the approval body to determine that proposed residential development includes congregate living units or assisted living units. And in the maps that have been shown and what we have in our, in our agenda packet says that there are assisted living units in this project. And you know, it clearly says right here that the floor plans shown on the project plans include studio, one bedroom, and two bedroom units and include 59 assisted living units with a total of 76 beds. If we apply the 15% inclusionary, that's nine units that would be affordable. And that's what we need in our community. And for something that's being built on church property and the commitment that the church has to serving people who are experiencing poverty and people who are low income, my expectation would be that we're trying to maximize the amount of affordable housing that's going into this project. Um, so I, based on the, the, um, our current code and what we have before us, I actually agree with the planning commission that um, nine units would be appropriate. And if that's not something that can pencil out, we should figure out how we can make that work um, because that's what we need. We have many homeless people who are seniors who are never gonna work again living on our streets and nowhere for them to go. And they cannot afford the market rate rents that would be in this type of facility. So, you know, I, I hope we can, I mean, I appreciate the effort to try to increase it by one, but that's not enough with where we're, where we're at in this community right now. And so, and I'm sorry if the, the staff misled you on that and maybe the staff is right and this will go through and there won't be an impact. But I think that that is up for legal interpretation um, because while staff might have their way of interpreting it, I think if this were in a court, it could be argued both ways. Um, so I'll just leave my comments there. Um, and um, yeah, I'll just leave my comments there at this time. Thank you all. Thank you, Council Member Golder. Thank you. So um, I just would like to, to speak to the, one, the appellant, Ms. Siegel, in that I don't. I didn't feel like the staff just presented us with this, and that and that we're supposed to sign kind of on the dotted line. It's something that had been in the works for several years, and I think of all the projects that have come before us, they've had the maximum amount of community outreach with the neighborhoods and with the council. And as soon as I was on council, or maybe even before, I met with the developers, and they asked my opinion, asked what the community would think, asked. They were really receptive, and. I saw it as a back and forth, as opposed to the project. It's not a, um, you know, a senior facility, but the one that I keep using as an example over in Seabright, where they slammed all those condos onto that single-family residence, and then the neighbors were worried about parking, and now they're turning the garage into an ADU. Like, that's the opposite type of development. And so, with with this, um, you know. I've seen a lot of churches also being redeveloped around town. We've seen some converted to housing. We've seen the one at the circles that's maybe gonna be housing, we'll see, right? And so I understand that these are getting redeveloped and people would prefer to have open space and prefer to have other things there. But I, you know, I'm, I'm also a realist and know that, you know, land use changes over time. And in real estate, <laughs> the first three rules were location, location, location. Yes, of course it's gonna be an expensive place to live, but I agree with my colleagues in that hopefully it'll turn over some single family residences that people will be able to rent or buy. Um, a concern that I have in regards to the affordability piece and the inclusionary is that in order to make it pencil out, if you will, those market rate units will be up and then the house that the, 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 they, they rented out grandma's house is now gonna be rented for more to pay for that facility that they're inevitably gonna need. And I do understand that there's, that not everybody will be able to afford this and that's really unfortunate. Um, as soon as I was presented with the first meeting, I went and met with my rep, sells the, all, 
extra insurance and I got long-term care insurance, so it's something that I could afford if I need or want, you know, for $20 a month for now, the cost of a cup of coffee a day, right? Um, and I know the other side where it's like one of, one of my husband's grandparents had to be essentially destitute for Medicare to kick in and put her in a, a different facility than my grandma got put in because, you know, their life circumstances where she was able to rent out her house. So I totally get that. Um, but I do think, by and large, I agree with the staff's recommendation. I do think that there will be impact to the, to the, to the monarchs. I'm not stupid. Like, I can see that they're across the street. There will be impacts. But to the extent that this developer has really, um, I felt, put out tremendous effort in bringing this project forward, I'm inclined to support the staff's recommendation at this point as well. Thank you, Council Member Golder and Vice Mayor Watkins. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I won't repeat, I think, what some of my colleagues have already stated. Um, I appreciate all who have been here. I also appreciate all of the outreach and work that's gone into this. Um, I do know that there's been a series of reductions, which I, I know density is, is a, of a concern and keeping that uh, feeling consistent with the community is also a priority. And I know that comes also at a cost for additional units potentially being more affordable. Um, I think, you know, my, my comment, I guess, or my question maybe is, you know, in terms of the legal opinion, we do have our legal uh, person here. <laughs> and, and I would like to have an opportunity to hear from Cassie. Hi, I was wondering if I was going to get called on. You're so thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, and I, you know, I appreciate this discussion and appreciate, you know, Council Member Brown and Council Member Cummings' interpretation as well. Um, what's I think could be emphasized a little bit more is that the section that the Planning Commission relied upon is in this other section that's entitled Alternatives, <laughs> and it has. <clears throat> excuse me, it has a bunch of other alternatives listed, like things that we consider, um, like the in-lieu fee, like dedicating land. So all of these things that we consider to be alternatives to fulfilling uh, the requirement, and it's in that section. And so, you know, I do think that if a court were to look at this, and I tried to look at it, you know, fairly, um, I think that if a court looked at it, they'd say, well, it's in this alternative section. It's got this kind of language that talks about may propose, and yes, it does have the shall language that comes in later, and I know that's what Council Member Cummings and Council Member Brown and the Planning Commission that they looked at, but all things considered, it looks like it's an alternative. And, uh, and I, think, I think that's the way most likely a court would come down on it, especially when we're talking about, um, you know, the public, we all need to rely on, you know, what is the clear, cleanest, clearest interpretation of a statute, right? And so, especially when something is going to cost somebody a significant amount of money, uh, I think a court would say, you know, this should be very clear, right? If we're going to require an applicant to, um, you know, put this much extra money, this much extra affordable units, it should be a little bit more clear than it is. So that's kind of the way that we, uh, I came down on the legal analysis of it. Well, I really appreciate that clarification and that explanation of your process to land where you did. I think that's really helpful information. Um, I guess just in conclusion, I know we've heard of, you know, anecdotal circumstances and issues around people needing this type of living, and the reality is that the data actually substantiates that as well. We have an aging population, like many communities, and we have a declining population of young people and working people being able to stay here. So having a diversity of housing options, including housing for our elderly uh, folks who are aging in our community is really critical to maintaining the fabric and the diversity of our community that we want to see. So I feel really um, happy to see this type of housing brought to our community for a, a number of reasons. And given all the conversation, we'll too be supporting the, um, the motion on the floor. Thank you, Vice Mayor Watkins. And I know Councilmember Golder had one more question. You had your hand raised. So I did forget to ask, um, and I don't know if fire's still on, but I was curious which fire station would have this facility in their first due, and if you've thought about which way um, you would enter, whether it would be via Westcliff or Powton, if they were coming from Almar or from downtown. There you are. Hi, Tim. 
Hi. Um, so it would most likely be our downtown station. So we would be coming down West Cliff, but you know, we can never plan for any emergency. We don't know what direction we're going to be coming from. And not only that, we don't know what direction we'll be leaving if there's another emergency that we have to leave. So there's, there's no guarantees on, on where we'll come in or leave from the facility itself. Um, our concern is once we're in the facility that we can easily get out of the facility. And that's, that's our main concern. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Thank you. I, I just wanted to make a couple of comments just to be very clear about where I'm at on this. Um, so one, I wanna thank the uh, community for your comments, for participating in this uh, conversation, for being engaged. I wanna thank the developers for uh, working with the community to uh, make adjustments. I mean, I, that is really a model for how, um, you know, we hope things happen when new developments come in. There's always going to be an impact. There's always going to be opposition. Um, and I appreciate that you've uh, been willing to have those conversations and make adjustments. Um, and so the, I'm, my, I want to say that I, I will be voting no on the motion um, because I, I just fundamentally disagree with the way our um, inclusionary housing rules have been interpreted in this case and, and others. Um, and I'm, I'm, I believe that we need to do better. Um, and that's not, you got the, the story and the interpretation of the rules that you got. So, um, you know, I understand that, but I, I just fundamentally disagree with those. And I think that we as a city council have a responsibility to be clear about um, the need for affordable housing, meaning we have to be proactive about that and, um, and, and help us figure out if our inclusionary ordinance is unclear in some places, which it apparently is, um, how we address that. You know, people, developers want a clear um, uh, set of rules. And the way that we operate, it seems there is always some interpretation. Um, and, and I've talked to attorneys who have a very different interpretation. And I don't know that this one's going to get resolved in court, but I wish you luck at the Coastal Commission, um, because I think that's where we're headed. Um, I'll leave it there and, you know, just ask us to please take this seriously so that we don't every time come to this point where it's like, oh, we, you know, we figured out that the least number of affordable units, we figured out a way to make sure that the least number of affordable units is required. That is what I see as a pattern. Um, it's happening here. I can't support it. All right. Um, I would just like to add a couple of comments. Uh, thank you. Uh, to my colleagues um, and thank you to all the community members I know that um, uh, uh, several of the emails that came in as well as other community members that were not able to come kind of reached out and um, this clearly is uh, uh, not a, a hearing on the project itself but a hearing on the appeals that were presented and the appeal of the inclusionary units, um, an appeal of the planning commission's decision of the inclusionary units. Um, I don't think that, that um, to me it was very clear uh, interpretation that if the 20% was not met, then here are its alternative options and the 20% inclusionary was met and um, thank you for um, entertaining uh, a, a rounding up of the affordable units because yes we need all types of housing in our community um, and three is better than none so um, I don't think that um, that was proven um, and so I, I will be supporting that. Um, and then in terms of the other appeal with the traffic study and the monarchs, um, you know, this is, I really appreciate um, Ann Siegel, your thoroughness, your persistence, your passion, your care, um, and that we have a community that is aware 
and really fights for our environment. I think that's one of the reasons why I love living here is we have such a beautiful nature and environment and people who care to protect it. And um, I think um, at this point, I, I, I'm not seeing any um, um, endangerment um, that um, was brought up in that appeal. So I will be supporting this motion that's on the table. We have a motion by Kalantari Johnson and a second by Vice Mayor Watkins. And um, I'd like to ask the city clerk to please call roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Golder? Aye. Cummings? No. Brown? No. Myers? I'm going to vote for the motion, so I'm an aye. And I just, again, would ask, ask the um, developer over time as the facility opens, um, just to keep an open mind about how the circulation can work for the neighborhood as best as possible. So I'm an aye. Thank you. Vice Mayor Watkin? Aye. And Mayor Brenner? Aye. The uh, motion uh, passes with five ayes and two noes. Council Member Brown and Council Member Cummings. Thank you. This meeting is now adjourned. Thank you.